Thank you. Good morning, members, and I now declare the meeting open to the public online. I'd like to welcome all of our members who are participating by video conference in this morning and to remain members about the protocols regarding the use of electronic devices. So uh, we've received no apologies. Um, are members aware of any apologies? No, thank you. Chairperson's business then, um, I wanted to flag up a couple of items. First of all, uh, we did the, the meeting yesterday with the Royal College of Surgeons. I think that was a sobering meeting, I have to say, in terms of the significant issues facing us in terms of waiting lists and in terms of people who are, who are waiting for surgeries. I think it was very useful. I want to thank the Royal College of Surgeons for the time that they, they gave to that meeting. Um, but I think that is an issue of some concern for us um, and will be will be moving forward. So we, we obviously have a briefing today on that on that issue. So members will be able to contribute and, and make remarks in relation to the meeting yesterday at that point. Um, I also did a meeting with uh, podiatrists uh, late last week and I have to say again I'm concerned and they are reflecting concerns um, in relation to people not coming for scheduled appointments in relation to interruption to their business and how they have often fallen out some of the schemes that have been put in place to pick up on business support. Um, and they're also worryingly saying that they're, they're seeing conditions now at a much more advanced stage than they would normally see them and all of the problems, both management and health problems that go along with, with that. Uh, so that, that's a matter of concern. I met with the Royal College of GPs as well, and they were discussing uh, their concerns around around similar issues in terms of people availing of appointments and people coming forward with uh, with things that are worrying them or troubling them, and they would be keen to meet with the committee to discuss the the uh, the provision of general practice uh, services as well. And finally, in terms of chairs business, I did a meeting with the. Uh, in relation to stroke services, met with Chest Heart Stroke and uh, British Heart Foundation in relation to the consultation on the um, review of services, and they are concerned that that, that consultation, you all remember there's a significant consultation on that issue completed, and they are, they are keen that that would be um, progress now. They understand that COVID had interrupted it at a point in time, but that it's significantly advanced and that in order to improve the outcomes for the population here, that that, that element of the, of the uh, review of services needs to be progressed. <coughs> so <clears throat> moving on then members to draft minutes, item three there is your minutes, which are at tab 3.1 of your pack. Are members content with the minutes? Yeah, thank you, members. There is one item arising there from the minutes. Members will recall the department provided a memorandum on delegated powers for the Health and Social Care Bill. That was included in your table papers last week and is also at tab 4.1 of your pack this week. This memorandum identifies the provisions in the bill which confer new powers to make delegated legislation. So now that the bill has been introduced, our members content that the committee uh, forward the delegated powers memorandum to the examiner of statutory rules. Members content with that, thank you. Okay. So moving on then to our first uh, substantive item briefing this morning, which is a briefing from the chair of the Interdepartmental Working Group on the Mother and Baby Institutions and Magdalene Laundries. I refer you there, members, to papers of tab five of your pack. A copy of the opening remarks are also included in your table pack at, at tab 5.7. I can advise members that the chair of the Interdepartmental Working Group on Mother and Baby Institutions and Magdalene Laundries is here today to update the committee on progress and on next steps. So I'd now like to welcome by video link Ms. Judith Gillespie, Independent Chair of the Interdepartmental Working Group. Are you able to hear us, Judith? Yes, good morning, Chair. Can you hear me as well? Yes, I'm hearing you, Judith, and thank you very much for coming along, and you're, you're welcome to our committee um, this morning, and please go ahead. We would love to hear uh, from you there in relation to progress and next steps on your on this important this important work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Good morning, and good morning to the members of the committee as well. And can I also introduce Eilish McDaniel from the department who leads on these issues as director 
of family and children's policy. Um, thanks for the introduction, and I really welcome the invitation from the committee to uh, give you an update on progress in connection with the historical mother and baby and Magdalen Laundry institutions. Uh, I know you didn't ask for this, but if members are content, I'd also be keen to provide a brief update on where we are on the second strand of the work of the Interdepartmental Working Group, which is on hist historical clerical child abuse. Um, you'll recall I last briefed the committee on the 26th of November last year, and at that stage, the report of the research by Queen's University and Ulster University was still in draft. And the committee was quite rightly uh, pressing for publication of the report as soon as possible. So I'm very pleased to advise that there has been considerable activity and progress since the end of November. You'll know that the research report is now published. Publication took place on the 26th of January. And on the same day, the executive made its decision about what would happen next. The decision was announced by the First Minister in a statement to the Northern Ireland Assembly on the afternoon of the 26th of January, after both she and the Deputy First Minister advised members of the Victims and Survivors Reference Group of the Executive's decision in a meeting in advance of it being made public. <coughs> With regard to the Mother and Baby Homes and Magdalene Laundry's research report, if members are content, I want to just very briefly outline what the, the research found and then go on to provide you with an update on progress made since its publication. Uh, it's really important, I, I want to firstly pay tribute to the work of the researchers at Queen's University and Ulster University, and to the lead researchers, Professor Sean O'Connell and Dr. Leanne McCormick in particular. The research report is both comprehensive and well-written, and as required by the terms of reference, it includes contextual information and information from the archives, including those held in the Public Records Office and in the records of the bodies who ran these historical institutions. It also includes the rich personal testimony of 60 individuals, survivors of the institutions or others connected with the institutions. The research examined eight mother and baby homes, a number of former workhouses and four Magdalen laundries. Three of the mother and baby homes were operated by Roman Catholic bodies, four by Protestant denominational groups, and social services and charitable bodies also operated similar provision in Northern Ireland during the relevant period. Workhouses were examined on a sampling basis only. Work was carried out on a number of sample years for Belfast's Union Infirmary. Three of the institutions described as Magdalene Laundries were operated by the Good Shepherd Sisters and one by the Salvation Army. In terms of the research report's key findings, uh, the research found that around 10,500 women were admitted to mother and baby institutions and over 3,000 women were admitted to Magdalene Laundries here between 1922 and 1990, the period covered by the research. I know it's hard to believe, but the last mother and baby institution closed in 1990 and the last Magdalen Laundry in 1984. As far as mother and baby institutions were concerned, there were strong similarities with the experience of women examined in the recent report of the Commission of Investigation into mother and baby homes in the Republic of Ireland, although there were a number of key differences. There was stigma attached to pregnancy outside of marriage. Women and girls were admitted by families, doctors, clergy and state agencies. They were required to undertake tough chores late into pregnancy. They had little preparation for childbirth and some had cold and castigating birth experiences. Many women and girls were separated from their children by placing them in children's home, in homes, boarding them out, in other words, fostering or through adoption. There was also the issue of cross-border movement of women and children into and out of these institutions. In terms of the key findings for the Magdalene Laundry institutions, the key findings from the research in relation to Magdalene Laundry institutions highlight that women and girls entered by a number of routes, including from mother and baby institutions. There is evidence of some admissions triggered by the circumstances of our past, for example, teenage girls and women being sheltered from forms of 
community rough justice. Girls were, were, and women were given class names and there was a greater number of children under 18s in the laundries than the Heart Inquiry was able to identify. Work was carried out without pay and some women spent a lifetime in the laundry, died there and were buried from there. The research was not able to reach, uh, fully reach definitive conclusions about adoption or infant mortality. These are matters which will need to be fully addressed by a future investigation. Questions about adoption may only be answered by accessing the records of children adopted. And questions about infant mortality may only be answered by accessing the records of those children who went to children's homes or were boarded out, in other words, fostered having been born to the girls and women of mother and baby institutions. The issue of adoption is further complicated because some children were moved across the Irish border prior to being adopted, some of them in the Republic of Ireland, some outside of Ireland, in Great Britain, or indeed in the USA, for example. Regarding the First Minister's statement, some of you were present in the chamber when the First Minister made a statement to the Assembly on the 26th of January outlining the decision by the executive to undertake a victim-centred independent investigation into both types of historical institution. Importantly, the executive decided that victims and survivors should be given the opportunity to shape the independent investigation, and they set a time frame of six months for this to take place. So turning to the co-design team, or the truth recovery design panel, as they prefer to be called, Members will be aware that on Thursday the 4th of March, a further announcement was made by the Health Minister and the First and Deputy First Ministers about the appointment of a co-design team to work alongside victims and survivors to help shape the independent investigation and its terms of reference. The team is made up of three individuals with significant experience and expertise in this area. In place of the title co-design team, they have chosen to use Truth Recovery Design Panel to describe their work. A, sm a small support office has been established to assist the panel with its work. Deirdre Mahan will lead the panel. Deirdre is the Director of Women and Children's Services and Executive Director of Social Work in the Western Trust. She has been temporarily released from her director's role to enable her to undertake this work. Deirdre has significant expertise and experience at a senior leadership level in the delivery, management and training of social work and has considerable experience of working directly with vulnerable groups. She is also a trained facilitator. Deirdre will work alongside Professor Phil Scraton and Dr Maeve O'Rourke. Professor Phil Scraton is a renowned criminologist, academic, author and social researcher known particular for, particularly for his investigative work into the context, circumstances and aftermath of the 1989 Hillsborough disaster. He was a member of the Hillsborough Independent Panel, heading up its research. Professor Scraton is Professor Emeritus in the School of Law at Queen's University Belfast and Director of the Childhood, Transition and Social Justice Initiative. Professor Scraton's work also includes research on deaths in custody, the marginalisation and criminalisation of children and young people, the politics of imprisonment, the analysis of disasters and their impact on the bereaved and survivors. Dr Mabel Rourke is a well-known lecturer in human rights at the Irish Centre for Human Rights, the ICHR, and a programme director of the BCL Law and Human Rights a newly established undergraduate degree programme at the National University of Ireland, Galway. Dr O'Rourke is Director of the LLM Human Rights Law Clinic at the ICHR. Dr O'Rourke's research interests lie primarily in the development of the rule against torture and ill treatment, human rights protections in institutional and care contexts, access to justice and redress for systemic and historical human rights abuses, and human rights research and advocacy methods. Dr O'Rourke has provided assistance to the voluntary advocacy group Justice for Magdalens and is currently a member of the research group 
Justice for Magdalene's research. I have to say, as independent chair, I am delighted that such a fiercely independent, experienced and eminent panel is engaged in this work. And I want to thank Eilish and her team for putting the necessary governance and administrative arrangements in place to make these appointments happen so swiftly. The panel proposes to work with victims and survivors to recommend the most appropriate form of independent investigation. Panel members have made it clear that the panel will explore the full range of investigation options and has committed to making the outcome of its work public. The panel has indicated that there are four possible forms the investigation could take, but they've also stated that other models might be considered. At this stage, the four possible options include a statutory inquiry, a non-statutory inquiry, an independent panel, or an independent review. It will be a matter for the panel to determine how it will undertake its work, but panel members have been clear from the outset that they want to cast the net as widely as possible within these shores. They will also reach out to the Irish diaspora, to individuals living in other parts of the world who may have been adopted, for example, having been born to women or girls who were admitted to Northern Ireland mother and baby institutions as a result of becoming pregnant. The panel has also insisted that apart from promoting participation in the process, it will undertake its work with victims and survivors away from public and media glare. Through the process, the panel has been asked to consider a number of issues as follows. The questions the investigation should ask and answer, how the investigation should run, how long the investigation should take, who should take part in the investigation, including importantly, who should chair, and whether legislation needs to be in place to support the investigation. The outcome being sought from the panel is advice for the interdepartmental working group, which I chair. That advice should include uh, recommended terms of reference for the independent investigation, explain why they're being recommended, and specify the extent to which they have the support of victims and survivors. I'd like to share information with members on the co-design participation and encourage you to share this widely, please. To promote participation in the co-design process, information has been placed on NI Direct. Anyone who wants to take part can do so by calling a dedicated phone number 0300 0200 789 or by emailing the team at truthrecovery.mbi-magdalene at nigov.net. All of this is in your briefing papers. It is possible to register an interest in becoming involved by completing a form on NI Direct and details of the NI Direct webpage are also in your briefing papers. It includes information on support services available and how to make contact with adoption services. A social media campaign is also ongoing to raise awareness of how to become involved. It is proposed that support services will be provided to those who participate in the co-design process. The Department of Health is working with the Executive Office to finalise co-design support arrangements. In addition, the Department of Health is currently working with the Health and Social Care Board and Trust Adoption Services to ensure that adoption services can sufficiently meet the demand for adoption tracing services triggered by the publication of the research report and the subsequent decisions by ministers. Uh, members be will be aware of the Victim Survivor Reference Group, which has been established. A, a number of committee members met with members of the reference group. This group first met in November 2020 to act as a point of reference for the interdepartmental working group and to enable the voices of victims and survivors to be heard directly. The reference group received an embargoed copy of the research report 24 hours before its publication. The reference group then met the first and deputy first ministers in advance of the publication of the research report and the public announcement of the executive's decision to conduct a victim-centred independent investigation. The reference group has also met with members of the Truth Recovery Design Panel prior to the public announcement of their appointment on the 4th of March. 
A further meeting of the group is scheduled for next Monday, the 15th of March. At the meeting on the 16th of February with members of the Health Committee, individual members of the reference group recounted their personal lived experience and their individual journeys. I know that you were moved by these accounts. I have heard them a number of times now, and I never fail to be moved by them. Members will recall there was a wide ranging and very powerful discussion from which a number of themes emerged. The call for a customized bespoke inquiry with powers to compel witnesses and produ produce documents. The need for archive material to be preserved and accessed. The frustrations of accessing information regarding cross-border adoption. The need for timeliness in the co-design process the requirement to develop bespoke support services, the call for answers to individual questions, in particular regarding identity, referred to as the missing pieces of the puzzle, the questions about burial, the need to learn the lessons from the past to improve future service provision, and the reference to interconnectedness of the institutions and state. You were also presented with a position paper on behalf of the birth mothers and their children for justice group. The paper calls for a statutory public inquiry, explains why a statutory inquiry is necessary and suggests terms of reference for the inquiry. It outlines the outcome an inquiry should deliver, including recommendations, redress and holding individuals to account. It also deals with the preservation of records and access to records to the conduct of the inquiry and how it should report. Importantly, it comments on the participation of survivors and how this might best be facilitated. It states a preference for an inquiry panel rather than a single chair and for a chair of the panel with judicial experience. The paper has been shared with the Truth Recovery Design Panel and I'm confident that that will help to stimulate discussion among other victims and survivors who participate in the co-design process. Uh, Chair, if I could now turn to the issue of historical clerical child abuse, which fell outside of the terms of reference of the institutional abuse inquiry. It is appropriate to note that it is the executive office which leads on this particular element. As members may be aware, the interdepartmental working group wishes to commission an in-depth research project on historical clerical child abuse in Northern Ireland. This research will enable the IDWG to make recommendations to the executive on any future action necessary. The research will not be restricted to abuse perpetrated by ordained clergy. It will also include abuse by those carrying out a role related to the ministry of a religious institution or faith group. As such, I've held a number of introductory meetings with churches and faith groups in preparation for the launch of the forthcoming research project. To help inform this area of work, I have established a separate reference group of victims and survivors of historical clerical abuse and their representatives. To date, there have been two meetings of the reference group in November and in March. At the most recent reference group meeting earlier this month, we took the views of members to further refine the draft terms of reference for the research project. The research is a key step in deciding the best way forward on addressing the impact and legacy of abuse. It will also help to inform how we can best address the needs and concerns of people affected, which is paramount. It is intended that the research will include opportunities to improve existing safeguarding practice, identify any systemic issues, as well as how best to engage with victims and survivors. It will also consider how best the needs and experiences of victims and survivors might be acknowledged. The IDWG is proposing that the research would be conducted by a team with a mix of skills, including experience of health and social services, of the justice system and public protection and safeguarding, and of investigation. It is intended that the team would also have access to human rights advice as the research progresses. Officials are in the process of amending the draft terms of reference to reflect the views expressed by the reference group. The IDWG has also been briefed. 
I have asked that the terms of reference are brought forward to the First Minister and Deputy First Minister as soon as possible for their consideration. Subject to ministerial agreement, I would hope to be in a position to commence the research project in late spring. With members' permission, I would like to take this opportunity once again to appeal to survivors of historical clerical child abuse to come forward to talk to me about their lived experience. This can be arranged in strictest confidence if that is what they would prefer, or if they were willing, they can take part in the reference group. To date, reference group members have raised important points in relation to the scope and depth of the proposed research. Their input really is a cornerstone to this work. Chair, that concludes my opening remarks. I'm happy to take questions that members may have, and thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you, Judith, for that very comprehensive update. I have to say, and, and it's clear, I think that there is a lot of a lot of activity going on in this respect, and that it, it is also, I think, clear that uh, victims and survivors are are central to that. Just a quick question on that: How many on the panel that you referenced there at the start, uh, the panel that is being chaired by or being led by uh, that includes Phil Scraton, that panel? How many uh, victims and survivors are on that panel? Oh, the panel consists of just the three expert facilitators, but they will be reaching out far and wide to include as many victims and survivors' voices as possible. Um, but how they do that uh, and the process is really up to the panel themselves. Okay, and then in terms of the archive materials that we discussed at the last meeting as well, um, has there been any progress or how satisfied are you What in terms of um, progress on that issue? And given the cross-border nature of all of this, can you update us on, on your thoughts around the archive materials? Are those secure? Are they being secured? Have they been secured? Uh, I understand the minister has written to all of the institutions asking them to preserve uh, the material, but perhaps, Eilish, you could give more detail on that. Yes, thank you, um, Judith. Um, Chair, yes, the, the minister um, wrote to all of the institutions um, who were involved um, in the research or the subject of the research. Um, that correspondence was issued on uh, in December of um, last year. Um, the Minister has no powers to require um, those organisations um, to provide um, the records um, to the Department of Health, but um, they have been strongly advised by way of the correspondence to take reasonable steps um, to preserve um, the documents um, that they have um, in um, their control, um, in the knowledge that they may be um, relevant to any um, future inv investigation. In, in addition, um, they have been advised to ensure the immediate suspension of any routine um, or um, procedure for deleting or destroying any of the documents um, in um, in their archives. Um, also asked to notify staff and former staff of the ongoing need to, pres to preserve um, documents. And then finally, um, to take reasonable steps to ensure that any agents or third parties um, don't delete or destroy potentially relevant documents. That, that, that correspondence also went to the Health and Social Care Board and has been shared with Health and Social Care Trusts um, also. Chair. Okay, thank you. And I wonder, does that speak to the necessity for a statutory inquiry that would have powers to compel? Is that one of the is that one of the key considerations that will have to be taken? That, that that's definitely one of the key concerns of victims and survivors the preservation of archives and access to archives um but of course all, all of this is part of the, um, the consultation process that the panel will be conducting with victims and survivors so that's a clear message that will come through loud and clear Okay, thank you. And then in relation to support services, can you update us what support services are currently in place or are being developed or where, where are the support services that you referenced, uh, Judith, please? Or are you out on those? Well, well, well perhaps <coughs> I, I'll talk, um, Eilish can, can give more detail on this. I'll just say some preliminary uh, remarks. Um, there will be support for those taking part in the design process, uh, immediate support available, but there will also be uh, longer just, just a second, Judith. Sorry, Judith. There's some, there's some interference coming. I'm not sure it was just me. Can I check that all members are on mute there? I'm hearing like a, like a noise coming through. 
uh, it's leaving it quite difficult to follow. Yeah, I think that's better now. Go ahead then, Judith, again, I apologize for that, sorry. Uh, yeah, no problem, it's a function of the technology, I guess. But, um, the, the support services will be in, in two stages almost, you know, there'll be the immediate um, support services available for those taking part in the co-design process. But there's also um, a co-design process leading to bespoke support services longer term. So maybe, Alice, do you want to say something more about how that will work? Yeah. Yes. Um, particularly, Eilish, in relation to the current services that are available, I'm, I'm interested in particular what's available now, because this is obviously a very difficult and traumatic process that, that survivors are going through right now. So those, that's my main concern at present. Okay, so one of the things that we have done, and again, it's, it, it's been done by way of the NI Direct website, is to signpost individuals to what we consider to be the most relevant services that are currently um, available, and, and uh, we can provide more information to the committee on, on that um, if you require. But in addition to that, um, for those individuals who will be participating in the co-design process, um, we will um, be contracting um, the Victims and Survivors um, Service, which is a, a, a subsidiary of, of, of TEO, um, to provide services to individuals um, who need them by virtue of being part of, of co-design. So, I mean, that might be um, providing a listening ear, um, uh, some emotional, psych psychological support, or, or indeed um, more intensive support if individuals um, actually um, require it. So we're in the process of putting that in place um, with BSS at the moment. Um, I, I am expecting a proposal um, today, and hopefully we, we will be able um, to get that signed off as quickly as possible. Okay, thank you, and I think it's important that, that that considers the full range of of measures that will support people, but also that will empower them to engage uh, with the sort of that equality of arms kind of legal concept that whatever they might need to engage in what will be heavy documentation, dramatic, and uh, that, that that will all be considered. Uh, I think that will be very very important, and I'd like you to sort of keep an eye on that end of things. And the final one then from me, um, Judith, you outlined that the research project will commence in late spring on the historical clerical abuse element. Yes. So can you give me a timeline for when, when you expect that to be completed and when you expect it to be published? Um, uh, well, that, that's of course all subject to ministerial agreement, but um, certainly if, if the research commences in late spring, um, at the moment, the plan is it would be completed within a 12-month period. Uh, but again, that is subject to discussion with the researchers, uh, but that's that's the plan at the moment. Okay, thank you. So I will go then now to members. I'll start there with uh, Deputy Chair Pam Cameron, and then I have Jonathan, Paula, Jerry, and Carol um, in that order. So I'll go then back to you, Pam. Go ahead, please. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Judith and um, Eilish, for your attendance at committee today on what's uh, quite a distressing subject for, for very many people. Um, uh, I wanted to kick off with, um, previously talked about um, that the public inquiry would have been the, the, the obvious course of action um, in response to initial research on mother and baby homes. Can you tell us why that changed? That would be my first question. And I also wanted to ask if... Um, <clears throat> if and investigation will have limitations in terms of its powers to call witnesses and in terms of um, any legal aid support for victims and sur survivors. Uh, okay, thanks for the question. F first of all, I I'm not sure um, that m my view or the view of the um, interdepartmental working group has, has ever changed. It's always been a question of putting uh, a range of options to ministers and uh, a preferred option and um, the issue of co-design with victims and survivors came out of discussions with the reference group and um, learning from international best practice and indeed uh, a number of commentators not least uh, Dr O'Rourke herself has, has said that this is a, a world leading approach and a number of other jurisdictions are looking at what's happening uh, with the co-design process in Northern Ireland. Um, to, to get the learning out of that. So I think um, it's always been a question of um, learning from the experience of victims and survivors and trying to put the, the very best option forward that would put them at the center. 
Um, so in terms of um, the, the powers, etc., of of whatever inquiry, that's a matter for the uh, again for the Truth Recovery Design Panel, and and they'll be taking all of that into account in in their deliberations about what is the most appropriate way forward. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, and can you tell me, is the interdepartmental working group, is it playing an active role in facilitating access by victims and survivors to records held by institutions in relation to their experience? Uh, the the interdepartmental working group won't be playing a, a direct role in that, but I know when it comes to, for example, adoption records, uh, I said about um, uh, Eilish's consideration about additional resources being made available within the trusts to meet the demand because there is no doubt it's very clear the demand has risen given the profile of uh, the research report and the public statements around it that there has been um, an increased awareness and people are coming forward <clears throat> to access records that perhaps they wouldn't have done previously. So it's important that the resources are there to meet the demand and to facilitate requests for information as so far insofar as it is legally possible. The complication, of course, is when it comes to cross-border access to records. Um, and I have had already two meetings with Minister O'Gorman from the Republic of Ireland. And now uh, with this facilitation process, we need to think about how um, cross-border access to records will actually practically be facilitated. Okay, and that's obviously quite a complicated process. I appreciate that. Um, and this might be a difficult one too, but it's the last one for me. And just to ask you around, you know, what you're envisaging as a timeline for completion of an investigation after this current six months. And, and presumably that will depend on the agreed terms of reference. Absolutely. that's It's, it's impossible to answer that question right now, but that's for the the panel to determine, but one of the messages that has come through from victims and survivors, again, loud and clear, is about timeliness. You know, this can't go on and on. Some of them are getting quite um, old and frail, in particular, the Magdalene Laundries um, demographic, the women who were in the laundries, those who are still alive are, are getting old, and, and it is important to deliver something as swiftly as possible. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Pam. Uh, Jonathan, go ahead, Jonathan. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Judith, uh, for your presentation. I want to congratulate you uh, on holding to your word in terms of the uh, swift uh, publication of the report following our, our meeting um, late last year. I, I think that um, that is certainly to be welcomed, and indeed, uh, any of us in the committee that have listened to the testimonies of these brave women uh, your heart can't not but go out to them and, and I, I welcome your, your approach in talking about a, a victim uh, led approach in, in all of this uh, as we go forward so ju just a couple of questions if, if I may uh, in relation to that we, we have been told uh, that the academic research indicates that the health and welfare authorities were involved to in degrees in the entry of women to these institutions how will the relevant departments demonstrate independence from the investigations? Uh, that's, that's a really important question, um, and it goes to the heart of confidence in whatever independent investigation is decided on. But this is not the first time that departments will have been subject to independent investigation, and I'm sure there are well-established processes by which there are firewalls put between um, those involved in the, in the investigation and those being investigated. Um, and I suppose it is really important to, to have the voice of, of those who, who know their way around the system, who know where records are held, who know what questions to ask, um, to have those voices also represented in, in the process. Um, but I accept it, it, it's, it's difficult to manage that, but it's not the first time, this is not the first inquiry where that will have had to be managed. I don't know if Eilish wants to add anything more to that. I, I, I suppose a, a reasonable comparator would be the historical institutional abuse inquiry. Um, you know, uh, departments were subject to um, investigation by way of that inquiry, and, and there was a very clear separation between how the, the inquiry was conducted and, and the departments um, who were um, involved as, um, as respondents um, to that inquiry. So I think Judith is right. 
um, it has been done before. It, 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 you know, it, it is possible um, to do, and my expectation is that it will be done um, it, it, by way of the independent investigation um, that, that, that the, the um, Treaty Recovery Design Panel is currently looking at. Okay, and, it's, uh, and I welcome the comments there because that independence element will be crucial in terms of credibility of the work going forward. In terms of the work that's take, being taken forward or potentially being taken forward by the Interdepartmental Working Group on Mother and Baby Institutions, are they separate to the independent investigation? Can you give us any indication on that? So the, the Interdepartmental Working Group will put a proposal to ministers uh, which will be recommended by the Truth Recovery Design Panel. So in six months' time, when they finish their co-design work with victims and survivors, they will put a recommendation to the Interdepartmental Working Group, which will then go to ministers for decision. So um, the, the Interdepartmental Working Group itself won't be developing um, a proposal. It will be the, the, the Truth Recovery Design Panel, if that answers your question. Yeah, no, that, that does indeed. And, and finally, you did touch on this in the previous uh, response in relation to the, the cross-border element of this and how that is adding an extra layer of difficulty in relation to um, compelling witnesses, etc. Are you in a position to elaborate on, on uh, how the independent investigation, um, how those powers will manifest in relation to calling witnesses from other jurisdictions? Again, I, I don't know. Um, that's something that obviously is going to have to be taken into um, account by the, the Truth Recovery Design Panel, uh, and it will involve an element, uh, a significant element of cross-border cooperation. How that will actually work in practice, that needs to be um, subject to further discussion. Okay, but what you are saying is those cross-border conversations that you're having at present and have had are positive in relation to the, um, the, the desire and will to ensure that we get uh, full accountability cross-border? Yeah, uh, th those questions have been uh, at a high level and agreement in principle has taken place. It's now a question of working out the detail of how that agreement in principle will be translated into something practical. Okay, thank you. I wish you well in this work. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. I'm going then to Paula. Go ahead, Paula, please. <clears throat> Just checking, do we have Paula Brad show Sorry, on the there's, line? Yes, there's Paula, a delay there in getting the um, unmuted. Um, thank you, Judith and Eilish, um, for coming today. Um, really, really um, pleased um, about the progress that you are, are making. I suppose my first question is around um, the resources for you, um, Judith, and your team. I have asked the health minister around this, but I'm conscious that because of the publicity around the research report, that a lot of more people have come forward. And I'm just wondering in terms, you said there, there's a small team now, but could you elaborate on who they are and whether you feel that it's sufficient to, to support you going forward? That's the first question. Yeah, and, and that's a really important question because as the profile of this issue has been raised, um, so the, the number of calls, the number of um, queries and uh, people coming forward who have perhaps never spoken before has grown and it's so important that we meet that demand. Um, I certainly have found um, personally uh, a lot of people now coming forward even just emailing me or, or wanting to talk about their experience and wanting to register their interest in being involved in the co-design process. So it's so important that we meet that additional demand. Uh, I know Eilish has been looking at the resources um, uh, for, for both the support offices and indeed in adoption services. So maybe Eilish, you want to say something more about that, please? Thank you, um, Judith. Yes, Paula, we put a, a, a reasonably small support office um, in place. Now that, that exists to um, support the panel and um, the truth recovery design um, panel. So. Um, it, it does include um, a qualified social worker um, among um, the team um, because um, we consider that it's important that um, when people are making calls um, to the support office that um, there's somebody there who can actually um, deal with maybe some of the issues that people want um, to discuss when, when they make that um, initial um, call. So the, the office is small at the minute, but there, there's the capacity um, to grow that if demand um, increases. At the same time, um, we're currently looking at our adoption services. 
So we do know that um, there has been an increase in the, in the number of calls to trusts um, seeking support um, with tracing, um, for example. So I think there's around 34 new referrals have been received since the publication of the um, report. And we know that 12 of those referrals have a direct connection um, with mother and baby homes. So one of the things that the department is looking at the minute is how we actually add to that resource um, to ensure that when people do make and um, the call seek support, want to trace, that our adoption services are, are capable of responding um, to the demand uh, as efficiently um, as possible. Thank you. And as you know, it's something I was campaigning for, for for many years to get more resources in there. So I'm glad it's finally happening. I suppose that the second um, issue is in relation to the paper that the birth mothers and their, um, and their children for justice have um, circulated around the public inquiry. Um, I, I, they make a very um, compelling case for it. Um, the only concern I would have about a public inquiry per se would be that um, it wouldn't bring forward then the, the likes of access to compensation and redress. You know that may push it down down the road. And as we know, a lot of the victims and survivors um, of mother baby homes are now quite elderly, and I, the last thing we need is for this exact same thing has happened with historical institutional abuse where people are actually dying before they actually get the redress that they deserve. So could you talk to us about how that part of the process could be expedited? Thank you. Well, again, um, uh, accepting all of the points you've made, Paula, that that is a matter for the, the truth recovery panel, the design panel. They are very mindful of the demographic the victim survivor population that they're working with, <clears throat> that they will want to listen to the views of, of all of the people involved. And I think it, it's really important to remember the, the, the Magdalene women um, and, and the point that I made earlier about the, the aging population that is that, that group of survivors of the laundries and um, the need to deliver something as swiftly as possible. But also, um, th there is the possibility of using the existing redress uh, scheme for those who were children in these institutions. And so we mustn't forget that it is possible in parallel to make sure that those who are eligible for redress under that scheme um, come forward and, and get uh, the redress that they deserve. Um, but all of this is a matter for the Truth Recovery Design Panel to consider in, in their um, deliberations regarding what is the most appropriate type of investigation going forward. Okay, and thank you. Um, um, and finally, for me, it's in relation to the reference group around the historical clerical child abuse. Um, when I met with um, TO officials probably about three or four years ago, um, I think uh, I think Eilish, you were maybe at that meeting, and, and one of the concerns was that it was hard to get a bit of traction because people were not coming forward to the, the department to um, you know, to tell their story and seek some support. How have you identified the, the, the members of that reference group? And the second part of that really is around, obviously, where there's um, clerical child abuse, there's obviously a criminal element to that. And, and so how are you separating that out and, and supporting those people around the sort of the criminal justice um, redress avenue? Thank you. So in, in relation to the first question, um, it's really been word of mouth, um, uh, reaching out to uh, survivor support groups, um, reaching out through the faith groups. Um, uh, you know, some of them have, have um, put people in touch with me, which has been really, really helpful as well. So it's very much been um, just word of mouth and, and friends of friends and this kind of snowball effect where you get one survivor on board who, who knows others and, and brings them with them. But I would like ideally to have many more survivors' voices represented on that group. Um, I can't remember the second part of your question, Paula. Sorry, could you ask it again? Obviously, if they're coming forward, they're, they're presenting yeah. the subject to a crime, uh, yeah. multiple crimes. Yeah, so some of the survivors actually have been through the, the criminal justice system and have had outcomes. Um, and their experience through the criminal justice system has been very, very powerful. Uh, and, and how they have, uh, you know, how they have been dealt with by the justice system. And that is equally part of the research that's uh, included in terms of reference, uh, how people have been supported through the justice system and, and what the outcome was at the end of it. Uh, and that's an equally important part uh, of the learning in all of this. So it's really important to hear survivors' voices, not just those who 
for whatever reason haven't been through the criminal justice system, but also those who have. And uh, a number have also taken civil actions and been through the civil process and, and got outcomes from that. And relating their experience, uh, how, the, how that felt for them is, is an equally important part of this research. Okay, thank you, Judith, and thank you to your team. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. And going then to Jerry Carroll. Jerry, go ahead, please. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Judith and, and Eilish. Um, in, in terms of the files um, that the researchers have, have, have had access to, um, I know the Chair was talking about the records generally, but the files that the researchers have, 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 have had excuse me, access to, have they been uh, protected? Um, and also a uh, second question, um, in terms of um, has the government or TEO or anybody in the department ha had any meetings with um, any of the charities, any of the institutions in relation to you know some of the issues generally, but also exploring operate the, the possibility of, uh, of redress as well, as far as you know? Uh, on, on the first question, uh, the files that the researchers had access to, um, they are still held by the institutions, um, although the researchers would have created their own records as well, and that they are being preserved. Uh, obviously, they have anonymized records and held under data protection regulations. So um, th their archive material is, is being held, but also the, um, the files that they accessed are still held by the institutions, and that's the, the letter that Eilish was referring to, the letter from the minister, which went to all of the institutions asking them to preserve and not destroy those, those records. Your second question about meetings with um, the institutions, I, I've, I have met with all of the, the faith leaders. I've met with the Archbishop and um, the, the uh, Church of Ireland Archbishop um, and the heads of the various... Protestant uh, Christian denominations. Um, there hasn't been any discussion around uh, anything other than taking forward the historical clerical child abuse um, research. So in terms of the uh, anything connected with redress and all of that, that's a matter, I guess, for the uh, Truth Recovery Design Panel um, to discuss with victims and survivors. But no, no meetings have taken place uh, in relation to that to date, so far as I know, and certainly not with charitable organisations that you referred to. Thank, thanks to that, Judith, um, and I appreciate the, the answers. I mean, I, I am quite concerned that obviously, um, you know, some of the records uh, sort of going by your answer are still maintained by the institutions, and I appreciate the Minister has, has um, written, as Ellie said, kind of strongly advising, um, slightly paraphrase maybe, but um, strongly advising that uh, they hold on to the records. But to me, that sounds um, quite a soft approach. You know, I think given the scale of abuse uh, and allegations here, I think there needs to be a stronger approach. And uh, to me, like it begs the question that, um, you know, surely the police should be uh, brought in to seize the records, protect them, uh, and the, at least have an understanding of, of what of who has what, um, and I think that's that's a question that many um, victims and survey survivors will be wondering. So um, I don't know if you can comment on that, but um, just to add in, um, I mean, in terms of uh, prosecution, um, I mean, is there any uh, discussion about prosecution, how that would happen? Um, you know, who would be likely um, targeted or, or brought in for investigation or, or questioning? Um, uh, and, and that I think is, a, is quite a, an important um, point and, and I think uh, just finally because I know we've, we've got limited time I think in terms of a, a statutory publicly, public inquiry I think obviously the, the terms of reference um, has to be in my view and, and the view of others shaped quite strongly by you know victims and survivors not in a you know t with respect not in a tokenistic way but in a in a strong way in terms of who can be compelled in terms of making recommendations so just to, just to comment on that uh, as well thanks um okay so uh, in relation to the the first issue about the minister's letter um, there is no statutory power at the moment. It, it's it's purely based on uh, moral authority. Uh, but I think it's also important to say that many of the institutions were very helpful in making their records available. Um, and uh, um, 
actually um, made, made everything available that was was there. But of course, some of the records are incomplete and some records are um, missing. And and so uh, whatever, even even with the best will in the world, the, the picture may be incomplete for some survivors, sadly, um, because some of the records are damaged or, or missing. Um, and, and in relation to police seizing records, it's important to, to remember that some of this archive material is not in this jurisdiction. Uh, and, and so uh, the, the, the minister's letter was the very best that we could do at the moment. And of course, if there is a some sort of a, 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 an inquiry with statutory powers, then that puts us in a much stronger position um, to require those records to be uh, both preserved and, and accessed. Regarding prosecution, um, yes, there has been discussion. Some victims and survivors want to see people held to account through, through the criminal justice system. But of course, that will depend on the evidence being available. It will depend on um, survivors being uh, prepared to to make uh, statements of complaint to the police, etc. Um, and and all of that will be part of the, the the truth recovery design process. But there are some people who want to see that happen. Not not everyone wants to see that happen, um, but but some certainly do. And and if the evidence is there, that has to be an option that that might be taken forward. And then finally, your point about the public inquiry, about the, the terms of reference being shaped by victims and survivors and, and not as a token. Uh, this is absolutely putting victims and survivors in the center of the process. And I know that the Truth Recovery Design Panel will be fiercely um, independent about that and will want to make sure that they hear all of the voices, not, not just those perhaps who have um, spoken the most about this, but they want to hear new voices as well, um, and to make sure that everybody's voice is heard in, in deciding what is the best way forward. So it's certainly not tokenistic as far as I'm concerned. Thanks, Judith. Okay. Thank you, Thank you Jerry. I'm going then to Carol Nikhil and go ahead, Carol, please. Um, so thank you very much for your appearance today at the committee. Um, the questions I have, you've partly answered them, Judith, um, in relation to for example, where adoptions occurred across the island and, and in the south, that there, w there won't be any birth certificates, I'm assuming, and that's a big issue at the minute. And the other question I have is in relation to where adoptions, um, or adoptions, sorry, happened with religious orders. So children, babies were taken to say, for example, Scotland, Glasgow and Edinburgh, um, and because you know, I've heard of anecdotal stories um, of that. And then the last thing is where babies died, um, and occasions there are no birth certificates or death certificates either. And I think that has been absolutely traumatic for the generations of families who have maybe just discovered that this happened, didn't know. And they're going through their own truth recovery process and trying to allocate those public records and they're simply not there. Mm. Not there. I mean, I know of one family of an elderly relative, really elderly, a couple of years ago, who was dying and made this massive disclosure. And the family have been trying to locate records and they're not there. There's no birth certificate. And indeed, um, they don't know if the child survived or not. So, you know, you've already outlined that in your report in terms of or your and your presentation in terms of missing records. It's just to get your views on that because it's particularly a live issue at the minute in the in the in the south. Okay, thanks for those questions, um, Carol. And maybe I'll ask Eilish to take the first and second one. But if I can deal with the third one first, which is about the mm -hmm. the, the babies who have died. Um, you know, the, the Queen's and UU research really, um, and this is not a criticism of the researchers, but it just scratched the surface of this issue and what it discovered raised really big questions regarding what happened to the, the babies who ended up in um, baby homes or indeed were, were fostered or um, boarded out, as, as the term was back in the day. Um, and that's a huge unanswered question. Uh, and because of the time limitations on the research, uh, they just weren't able to get into this in any detail. But the, the sampling that they did do with regard to the one baby home um, on the Ormo Road 
was uh, really quite alarming with regard to the, the mortality rates of infants who, who ended up in the baby homes. And we, we know that a very significant percentage of babies who were born to, to um, girls and women in mother and baby homes ended up in separate baby homes and indeed were fostered or, or boarded out. And there just isn't that um, trail of uh, outcomes, you know, from, from birth to what happened to them. Um, it, it's just uh, impossible. It wasn't possible for the researchers in, in the time that they had to, to answer those questions. So any inquiry, any investigation that comes out of this, um, I think will that will be a very significant plank of that investigation again that's up to the um the panel to decide what that looks like but it's for me that's a really important part of the investigation because the babies who died don't have a voice and yeah. um, from what you've said um you know that there are revelations about people who who are coming forward now who want to know what happened to these babies that um are, are, are wanting legitimately wanting to find the answers to that so so those are really important questions that need to be answered Anish, I'm going to ask you to talk about the, the other two issues about the adoptions, please. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think members um, fully understand that the research wasn't able to reach mm -hmm. definitive conclusions about um, adoption um, at all. Now, that's partly because the research had no access to adoption records and to, to fully answer the questions um, about adoption, adoption records will need to be um, accessed and, and that will be a matter for an independent um, investigation. You're quite right, Carl, um, the adoption journey starts with a birth um, record and, um, and uh, absolutely access to birth records too will be incredibly important um, for an independent um, investigation. Um, so a lot of work um, to be done to get um, to the answers um, about adoption. Um, in those historical um, institutions. We know what the, what the law required um, mm -hmm. historically about the movement of children out of the jurisdiction, um, for example, and we, we need to examine um, whether um, the law was um, followed in, 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 in all the cases of those individuals um, where adoption was the outcome. And, and, and finally, um, Chair, we're hearing of uh, horrific uh, stories that you know, there was faked pregnancies of uh, women who were going to receive a baby from the mother and baby homes um, or the Magdalen laundries. Um, and there was no record whatsoever of the, you know, even the girl or the woman being in an institution in the first place. Uh, sorry, the records are very vague about them being there, but what happened to them or what happened to their babies um, we're only hearing some of the stories coming out now. Um, do you believe that it's only through a public inquiry that you'll get to the truth recovery and indeed the truth underneath this just horrible and tragic um, uh, shame for us all? Because uh, I believe that's what it is. I believe it's a completely national shame, the way in which girls and women were treated right up until the 80s and 90s. But certainly, do you is it is your own instinct that we will not get to the as much to the truth as possible in absence of a full public inquiry? Um, I, I I agree with you that it is shameful the way girls and women were treated, and in many cases, girls and women who had been the victim of um, sexual crime, who had been mm -hmm. the victim of rape incest um, on lawful carnal knowledge and then were doubly victimized in the way that they were shamed and, and treated in these institutions and worse still some of them ended up then in a laundry after having given birth to um, their babies uh, so it, yeah it, it's absolutely shameful it's appalling it's grotesque it's all of those awful descriptive words um you talked about faked pregnancies the research uh, i don't believe um came across any evidence of that happening in Northern Ireland, although I know um, that appears to have happened in, in the Republic of Ireland. Uh, uh, but they certainly didn't, um, to my knowledge, uncover any evidence of faked pregnancies. But there certainly were, in many cases, um, very vague or scant records. In fact, there was this, um, this policy of not asking how girls and women 
uh, ended up pregnant. That was a concerted policy that we don't discuss the circumstances in which they came into this um, institution. And it was described as um, a cloud of unknowing, I think was the term, you know, nobody asked the question uh, and therefore nobody dealt with the trauma that the girl or the woman had even before she came into the mother and baby home. And the records uh, often were, were, you know, names were changed or, or um, girls and women were not encouraged to talk about their experience with other women in the institution. So um, it, it was all very much no questions asked, very scant records kept, and therefore that makes um, tracing archive records very, very challenging. Uh, so uh, in answer to your question about uh, is the public inquiry the only way, I would say even with a public inquiry, even with full access to archive records, even with the statutory powers to compel witnesses, there may still be some questions that remain forever unanswered, and that's desperately sad. Um, but certainly powers to compel, powers to require records would be very, very helpful um, to, to get answers to as many people as possible. Thank you, um, Judith, Thank for you. your work. It's, it's very difficult. I listened to those testimonies, so just to put on a record, and at least too, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. I'll go then to Orlea Flynn. Orlea, go ahead, please. Um, thanks, Chair, and thank you to um, Eilish and, and Judith for coming to the committee today and providing us with um, all of this information and update. Um, I just wanted to ask on... Um, Judith, I think you had touched on it around the, so obviously the, the inclusion of as many survivors' voices as possible in this process of, of co-production and co-design. And you had mentioned the NI Direct um, website, the email that people can access, and then also that dedicated um, phone number. So I'm just wondering, um, the, the social media campaign uh, that you have spoke about sort of launching to, to raise the awareness about how people can become involved. Has that been launched yet or has that still to, to take place? And I know that I have been contacted even um, from the report was was um, published a couple of months ago. Um, people have reached out to me individually to say, you know, look, um, here's my experience. How can I get involved? How can I take part? So um, aside from the, the NI Direct and the email and the dedicated phone line number um, and the social media campaign, has there been any consideration to try and get mainstream media to try and um, sort of elevate it for you to, to, to give people an opportunity to have their say in this process? Thanks for the question and, and I welcome any opportunity to um, get the the contact details out into the public domain and um, we have considered all forms of, of media and uh, for example the after the spotlight program which went out on tuesday evening i know spotlight created the details of of contacting you know the, so it's on the bbc um uh, twitter feed as well uh but i'm very conscious that the, the again going so i'm getting some feedback here is everybody getting feedback or is it just me there's a bit coming through to me as well can everybody just check their on mute please again thank we're you we're still hearing you okay judith it might be difficult but we are hearing you okay thanks chair um i am very conscious of the 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 demographic here um and many of these women and, and indeed their, their grown-up adopted children may not be on social media. So it is important to think about the mainstream media. Um, and, and quite often my experience has been that it has been sons and daughters or nieces and nephews or uh, you know relatives of these women who have brought this to their attention by seeing it on social media or indeed um, in other media in the mainstream press. So we need to consider all of those options. Your, your question about um, has the social media campaign been launched? I, I believe it has, although I'm not 100% sure but I certainly have done um, video recordings to be put out on social media. So the, the preparatory work has been done and I think it has already gone live, uh, but I'm not 100% sure to be honest on that. Uh, I can check that. No, thanks very much, Judith. And apologies if it has, because then obviously I, I've missed it, but um, certainly I'm sure along with the rest of the health committee members will be more than happy to um, you know, promote this for you and, and to share all those, all those those details. Um, my my final question, just quickly, um, 
Eilish, you had mentioned earlier around uh, one of the questions that Char had asked about the current supports for people then obviously that are getting involved in the process and that might need that, that support um, afterwards. So the, the, the NI Direct website that obviously offers some of those agencies that can help and support people, um, are you able to monitor how many people are availing of that type of support? And I'm only asking that question because as more people uh, will hopefully come forward and, and get involved, it's do you have the capacity with the, the resources that you have at present to help and support people uh, through that process? Uh, in response to, to your question about will the department be monitoring, um, I, I think I just need to make it abundantly clear that the department is actually quite separate from that process. So our role was to ensure that those support pro, uh, uh, those support services were put in place. As and when people access them, that will obviously happen through a co-design process that the department is actually sitting quite separate from. So, I mean, it's something that certainly I can raise with the, the panel um, itself. Um, ask whether it proposes um, to monitor the extent to which those support services are being accessed. I mean, I have had the conversation with the Victims and Survivors um, Service, and what we've agreed is that they will monitor um, who will um, access um, their service, and if demand exceeds um, what, 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 what we think um, it will be, they will come back to me, and, and we may need to um, increase that um, contract or provide more under that contract um, or earlier. Uh, very good, Ellie. You know, thank you for for clarifying that. That's very useful. And thanks again. Thank you, Arlia. And uh, going then finally to Alan. Go ahead, Alan, please. We're not we're not hearing you, Alan. Can you just check, Alan? Uh, we're not we're not hearing you from you, Alan. Can you check Can you if you're me? on mute? Can you hear me now, Chair? Yes, we're hearing you now. We're hearing you now. Sorry, we're hearing you now, Alan. Yeah, go ahead. Chairman, I was just saying that every time I listen to these presentations, I'm, I'm, I'm filled with two emotions, um, sadness and, and anger in, in equal measure, uh, and then followed by compassion for the many little babies that were treated like commodities and who have grown up with so many unanswered uh, questions. But looking back at the way various things were done back in the day, we must appreciate that many situations represented the circumstances and standards of the time. But these baby and mother homes in the Magdalene laundries and the associated treatments can't be explained away or justified in any shape or form by the passage of time. They were cruel places and their regimes must be condemned and exposed. Um, so what I would like to ask, um, Judith, um, in terms of uh, the victims, is there um, consensus uh, among them, a sort of general consensus among them about the shape that the inquiry uh, should take? Um, you know, you worry that there may be some who will be happy with the, the final model and some who may be disappointed with it, but just is there a consensus? And um, are they happy at the moment uh, with the input that they're having into trying to shape uh, what form the inquiry will move forward in? And would a full statutory inquiry be the preferred choice? Uh, but are there any sort of downsides in that? Is any of the other models uh, be a better option for the uh, for the victims, or, or is the statutory a full statutory inquiry? It certainly would be my choice, but I'm just wondering: uh, does Judith feel that that will provide the best outcome for the victims? Thank you. Um, these are the really big questions that uh, we're asking the Truth Recovery Design Panel to answer, and that's why we've got such eminent, experienced, knowledgeable people uh, involved in this process, Alan. Um, and uh, just to answer your question on consensus, is there consensus? No, there isn't. There, there are loads of different views. Everybody agrees that they want justice and they want accountability. 
but what that actually looks like when you when you uh, scratch below the surface of well what do you mean by wanting justice there are different and subtle ways in which people express their different um, desire um, a number of victims and survivors have expressed to me this um, idea that they want some sort of restorative approach where they'd like to meet with the institutions where they'd like some expl explanation as to why they were treated so coldly and cruelly um, and to look people in the eye and, and have that discussion to other victims and survivors the idea of that would be repugnant um, some want an apology others do not think it's too late for an apology and all they want is accountability redress and, and criminal prosecutions so if you ask someone what do you mean by justice it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people and that's why it's so important that we have such experienced people leading this um, discussion and, and working with victims and survivors to to um, design the very best possible outcome um, that we can that we can get and you know like everything we will probably not please everyone but if there's something in this for everyone and if it delivers something for everyone then that that would be success as far as i'm concerned and and you asked um are, are victims and survivors happy with the, sh the way things are shaping up um the, most if not all uh, have welcomed the the panel uh, a very eminent and experienced group of people um that there is a huge responsibility on their shoulders and they are very conscious of that um but no better people for the job and and i look forward to to the outcome of, of their work with victims and survivors and and it is about putting victims and survivors right at the center of that at the end of the day yeah well judith i'd just like to place on record my appreciation for the work that you have done to date uh, on this subject thank you thank you Okay, thank you. And um, Chiara has indicated that her questions have already been picked up on, so she has she has uh, she's she's content with that, and I appreciate that in terms of in the interest of time. So thank you for that. Uh, so listen, thank you again, Judith and Eilish. I have to say, you know, it is it is clearly a huge amount of work. I am pleased to see that, and I think we're all pleased to see that the, the victims and survivors are central and their voices are being heard, and that that support is being developed at, at the very least of being being delivered to them which is which is crucial to allow them to continue to engage in this process in a meaningful way but i want on behalf of the committee to wish you all the best in the time ahead in this very very important work and i agree with the comments that this is an absolute shameful episode in our history as a, as a nation and we do need to ensure that this can never happen again and that those who suffered from it are find some part of the solution that that they are seeking that it, along the the many the many various aspects of that that you have outlined and um, judith and we will certainly as a committee also when when we can and where we can would share those contact details to try to encourage money to take part thank so thank you for coming along today and we look forward to engaging with you in the future again around this key issue thank you very thanks. much thanks very much chair and coming good morning thank you Okay, thank you, thank you, members, and, th and thank you for for keeping that um, on track. There, uh, I do appreciate that. Um, I wonder. I'll, I'll take comments now, but I'm just wondering: um, should we look about putting this back on the forward work program, maybe from the co-design team to get a further update? I think this is an issue that we should keep a kind of a watching brief on and and to ensure that things are moving along and, and pick up on some of the issues that are being raised as this unfolds. Would members be content, or members any other things they, they wish to suggest in that light, in that respect? Can can chair. Sure. With that, Paula, were you looking in? Um, I think it was Carol first. Go ahead, Carol. So uh, yes, I would be content, um, and I appreciate the comment you said at the start. You know, in terms of our time and all the rest of it, but you know, this 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 is something that you know we personally I feel on the committee that we need to be you know fully supportive of and as needs to be part of our our work yeah paula um thank you chair and i'm really pleased to get that update on the historical clerical child abuse i think that's very very significant and i suppose that's something that we need to maybe get a, a more full update as the terms of reference are published um and as people start to come forward but again i'm really pleased to hear that today yeah Okay, well, listen, um, we will we'll take a, a very short break there, members, and go back to our departmental briefing on waiting list. If we could take a five-minute break, so if we're back for just after quarter till again, please.
Thank you. That's you then. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Signed.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. Okay, thank you members. Um, so we're now resuming our meeting with a departmental briefing on waiting lists and waiting times. Um, this is a briefing from the department um, on elective waiting times. I refer members to the briefing paper which you received at tab 6.1 of your papers and to correspondence concerning waiting times at tab 6.2. The briefing paper from the Royal College of Surgeons is also included in your table pack there at tab 6.3. So I would now like to welcome Ms. Lisa McWilliams, who is Director of Performance Management in the Health and Social Care Board. Are you hearing us okay, Lisa? Yeah, are you hearing us okay, Lisa? Just double checking. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you there, Lisa. Thank you and welcome to our committee. We're also joined by Mr. Paul Kavanagh, who is Interim Director of Planning and Commissioning within the HSCB. Can you hear us okay, Paul? I can, Colin. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. And Mr. Alistair Campbell, Director of Hospital Service Reform within the Department of Health. Are you able to hear us okay, Alistair? Just check again, Alistair. We haven't heard from you there. I'm not sure if you're able to hear us. No, I can see. I, you, I have you on the screen. We can see you, Alistair, but we're still not hearing you. No. No, we're, we're still not hearing you, but what I might do is maybe we'll go back to Lisa and just maybe we'll proceed and hopefully Alistair will be able, I'm sure he's resourceful enough to get that sorted out in the meantime. So Lisa, is it yourself doing the principal, the principal briefing? It is indeed, Chair. Uh, okay, well listen, sure, go ahead, Lisa, then, and, uh, and please go ahead and, and brief the committee on the issues concerning. Thank you. Yeah. 
thank you. Uh, good morning, Chair uh, and members, uh, and thank you for the opportunity to brief the Health Committee on the waiting times for elective care. Uh, the Chair has alluded to the short paper that was provided in advance, which I hope has been helpful. Uh, with your permission, I'll outline some of the key points covered in that paper. It is regrettable that any patient has to wait longer than they should for assessment, diagnosis or treatment. And I fully understand the distress and anxiety that long waiting times cause, particularly when patients are suffering pain and discomfort. Long waiting times also have a societal impact much wider than the individuals themselves. We last briefed the committee on elective waiting times in February 2020. Since then, COVID-19 has presented our health and social care system with its biggest challenge since its foundation. And that is in the context of the huge strategic challenges facing the HSE prior to the pandemic, which are well highlighted in the Bengoa report and delivering together agenda. Waiting times for patients have been unacceptable for some time and have deter deteriorated further as a consequence of the pandemic. At the end of December, 2020, some 320,000 people were waiting for a first consultant-led outpatient appointment for assessment. Almost 85 of those have been waiting longer than the target of nine weeks and more than half longer than a year. In relation to treatment, 105,000 patients were waiting to be admitted at the end of December 2020. Similar to the assessment position, 82% have been waiting longer than 13 weeks and more than half were waiting longer than one year. At the end of December, 115,000 patients were waiting for a diagnostic test. Of those, 60% had waited longer than nine weeks and 36 longer than 26 weeks. While the number of patients waiting longer than nine weeks at the end of December is broadly similar to the previous year, it is an improvement of the position at the end of May 2020 when we saw 93,000 waiting longer than nine weeks. Prior to COVID, the trend and demand for hospital-based elective services had been increasing, influenced by the growing aging population and with the greater prevalence of chronic health problems. This increase in demand had not been met by corresponding increase in capacity, and as a result, people were waiting longer than the target at waiting times. This trend is expected to continue and will only be addressed if we take action to increase capacity, promote healthier lifestyle and tackle health inequalities. As I've alluded to, the impact of COVID-19 on waiting times has been profound and will undoubtedly be long lasting. Throughout the pandemic, the HSC continued to provide high priority and urgent services such as emergency care and time critical treatments. Given the detrimental impact of COVID on elective care and the reduction in the level of HSC capacity that could, could be delivered, the need to explore all opportunities, both within the HSC and the independent sector, to see and treat patients was of paramount. To this end, the Health and Social Care Board worked closely with three local IS providers to increase theatre capacity during 2021. In the first stage of the pandemic, HSC had the full access to all three local IS hospital facilities to treat cancer and time critical patients. Although these arrangements ceased at the end of June 2020, the HSC has continued to access IS capacity on a theatre session basis. As a result, many thousands of patients have been treated by HSC consultants in private healthcare facilities, approximately 4,600 in the year to date. In addition, the HSC has secured capacity from a number of other IS providers, both within Northern Ireland and in the Republic of Ireland, to provide assessments, diagnostics and treatments. Furthermore, a number of private healthcare providers are insourcing services, whereby privately recruited teams of consultants and clinicians are using HSC infrastructure to treat HSC patients. The HSC will continue to require access to IS capacity to reduce the backlog of patients for assessment and treatment for some time. During the pandemic, it was essential that all available capacity was protected for the highest priority patients, but on an equitable basis. Following the significant challenges over the Christmas and New Year period, the Health Minister agreed a regional approach to the prioritisation and management of elective activity. As a consequence, a regional prioritisation oversight group was established, chaired by myself. This group has met on a weekly basis since January to ensure that the relative clinical prioritisation of cancer and time-critical cases across specialties 
and trust boundaries is consistent and transparent to ensure all available theatre capacity, both in-house and in the IS, is fully and appropriately maximised. This regional approach, whilst remaining agile, helps minimise the risk of post-code laundering and ensures the allocation on a clinical prioritisation basis. Whilst this may mean that patients will need to travel further for their surgery, it is better that the highest priority treatments are delivered rather than not at all. If the vaccination programme is successful, SARS-3 will hopefully be our final surge of this pandemic. Even then, we're only at the start of an enormous period of rebuilding. The department's rebuilding health and social care services strategic framework requires trust to prepare three monthly rebuilding plans, seeking out how routine activity will be restarted in the wake of each surge. HSE Trust made enormous efforts to resume elective services and succeeded in rapidly increasing activity over the last summer. Regrettably, from the point that unscheduled admissions began to rise significantly in October 2020, there has been a prolonged detrimental impact on elective services. By way of example of the efforts of staff, from the 1st of October to the 31st of December 2020, Trust committed to delivering 228,000 outpatient consultants. In fact, they delivered 264,000. Similarly, they aimed to deliver 114,000 diagnostics and instead delivered 142,000. Taking account of the de-escalation as we come out of Surge 3, coupled with the need for staff to have time to recover from the demanding winter, Trusts have been asked to develop plans for the period April to June 2021 and thereafter on a three-monthly rolling basis. These plans will be published. This will of course be subject to the future pattern of the pandemic and the number of patients requiring unscheduled admission. As part of these rebuild plans, Trusts will have to outline their plans for green pathways and green sites to ensure complete separation of planned routine services and emergency services. The rescheduling of theatre list is currently underway and trusts are slowly increasing the provision of in-house capacity, which will help equalise waiting times across the region. Waiting list additionality within the HSE trust will, however, take some time to be re-established. The bottom line is that our waiting lists are too long and are getting longer. We know the way that services are structured are not fit for purpose and the elective care plan's roadmap for reform was outlined in our last briefing. However, reform will not be enough without investment necessary to deliver it. Without major sustained investment, it will not be possible to return waiting times to an acceptable standard. The Minister has made it clear that hospital waiting lists across all programmes of care must be a major priority in 21 and beyond. The level of funding available will be made clear with the budget bill, but I can assure the committee that work is already underway to ensure that any additional investment is fully utilised to best effect. In summary, addressing the waiting list backlog and reforming services to ensure future sustainability is complex and will take time. Multi-year funding, both recurrent to close the capacity gap and non-recurrent to address the backlog will be required over and above what is needed for the delivery of core services. The required investment continues to be estimated to be in the region of 750 million to 1 billion pounds, and it is likely to take up to 10 years to tackle this challenge. Thank you, and I'll be happy to take comments from the committee. Okay, thank you, Lisa. And um, I suppose, firstly, for me, we have we have met in a, in, informally with the Royal College of Surgeons, and they have outlined, you know, some of their some of the difficulties and some of the suggestions. Um, prominent among which were the were the development of green pathways and sites. So, um, and they had, I suppose, they had we, we discussed the need for urgency and the need for focus, and in in terms of this, and, and a similar type of urgency that that we, we've seen in terms of redesigning services around COVID. So are you satisfied that the trusts and how do you ensure that the trusts will have this plan in place that will significantly press down and will provide those green pathways um, very quickly in April? And so we're not waiting, we're not discovering in June that there's a lag time or, you know, how are you ensuring that that urgency is maintained? 
Uh, thank you, Chair. And what I would indicate is that we have been operating a number of COVID light sites in a number of our hospital trusts and facilities throughout the pandemic. Um, so Daisy Hill, when the, uh, the emergency department had been uh, coupled in with Craig Avon, acted as an, a COVID light site. And then we have many of the uh, Lagan Valley down mid Ulster have continued to act as COVID light sites. So we do have uh, COVID light sites that are separated from uh, particular emergencies and unscheduled emissions. Um, the trusts in their plans for April to June will be looking at sites including the likes of the Musgrave Park Hospital where we can undertake our orthopaedic activity in the Belfast Trust to see how the workforce can be protected um, and also to ensure fractures are not decanted into that site therefore preventing it from being a COVID light site. Uh, so workforce is key uh, and the scale and pace including the uh, designation of the uh, city hospital um, for the complex surgery will take a, it will take time but the trusts in their plans for April to June will step through the scale and pace of their green pathways uh, and their green sites because it is acceptable that you'll have green pathways in sites that have an ED uh, and have unscheduled emissions but you separate wards admissions and you separate emergency theatre access and um, so the trusts are working through that and there's a very clear expectation and there's a clear desire for the trust the clinical teams and the management to actually resume elective services. Okay, and, and thank you for that. And that actually leads me on then fairly fairly neatly to the, the, the other major and perhaps the major issue. As we all know, all of these services and procedures depend upon people and those frontline staff who have been so hard pressed. And, and regardless of what infrastructure you have, if we don't have the, the nurses, if we don't have the anaesthetists, if we don't have all the ancillary staff there, so given the pressure they've been under, but also given the fact that many of them have re been redeployed out of the areas they were trained for and would be keen, I think, across the board to return, um, what can you outline for us what the plans are and the timelines in order to uh, rebuild those uh, key people back into the, uh, to make them available again for these key surgeries? Uh, thank you, Chair. And as we've been de-escalating, uh, as we've come out of uh, Surge 3 over the last number of weeks, we have been moving, I, I suppose, what you would, the operative staff, so at the theatre nurses and the surgical ward staff, have been being relocated back to the jobs that they would normally do. Uh, so we've been doing that in a very phased uh, step as we have been able to uh, close the escalated ICU beds. So we have already started that process of, re you know, uh, I suppose, reverse uh, deployment back to uh, core jobs. Um, but in the trust plans, they have, uh, they are building in a period of downtime for staff, but uh, undoubtedly staff have also indicated that actually returning to their core jobs um, is, is, is a type of break, although not a full break. So people are keen to get back to what they would normally be doing. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. Yes, Paul, go ahead. Well, maybe, maybe just to add to that, um, I've been very closely involved in the critical care operational hub that we've haven't had in place since uh, since January, because uh, this third wave column, as we all know, has been had a very, very severe impact on health and social care in Northern Ireland. I must say I'm immensely proud of our staff for the work that they've done in recent months. I'm very humbled by them as well, because they really have uh, gone more than the extra mile uh, column. And I think I, I'm sure the committee would share that sentiment as well. I, I, the, and I think the, the challenge has been that we did reach a, a point where we had increased our, our critical care bed to such an extent that we'd drawn staff in from a whole range of other parts of the system, not just within our hospitals, but all with, also within some of our community services, drawn staffs, particularly from the likes of theatres, uh, who have obviously have some sort of shared skills with critical care staff, uh, so are, are very useful, but also across the board. So we've had a whole range of staff uh, coming into our system uh, of critical care in recent times. And what we also found with the third wave column was that longer lengths of stay have also been evident. So we've had patients longer in those beds, a lot more beds actually put, put up compared to our, our, our normal critical care, and a mix then in terms of trying to cope with the number of patients who were, uh, who, were who had COVID-related uh, conditions and also the, those non-COVID, those, those uh, things that we would have any other year in relation to critical care requirements uh, in terms of things like major trauma and so on. Uh, so it, it has been very challenging for us to, to reduce. And one of the, the principles 
goals I think we're very clear of is as we reduce, and we have seen a considerable reduction in the last three weeks of the number of critical care beds that we've had, we're very conscious that we need to give staff some time to rest. Uh, and, the, and each of the trusts are thinking about that in terms of as we reduce beds, one, the staff who have come from all over Northern Ireland to support the Nightingale in Belfast City, they have been released back to their, their home trust and, and uh, are, are getting some time off as well. Uh, the staff within uh, Belfast are beginning to actually get some of the respite they need as they begin to return to their work in theatres. So in that way, we haven't just been able to kind of flip the switch and say, today you're doing uh, critical care, tomorrow you're back in, in a theatre and you're back in a surgical ward supporting patients. We've had to be patient. So, so the de-escalation has taken longer than, we, than I think we would have first anticipated, but it's a reflection of the number of patients still in our beds. And while we're in much better shape today, Colin, than we were a month ago at the same time, we're not out of the woods yet. And I think everyone kind of recognizes that. But, I, but again, we have to give our staff a chance to, to recuperate and get back to the hard work and the excellent work that they do. Yep, thank you. Okay, I'm going to go then to members' questions. So I'm I'm going first to Pam Cameron, uh, Deputy Chair. Go ahead, Pam, please. Thank you, Chair, and um, thank you to the panel for being here today uh, on a, such an important issue. Um, and Chair did refer to um, an informal briefing that we had with the the Royal College of Surgeons yesterday, and one of their um, key messages. To us was that patients were presenting with conditions that we've not seen for years, like perforated colonic cancers and ruptured hearts. Um, they also referred to the waiting list as devastating, and they spoke um, about nursing staff being their most important resource. Um, and obviously, fair pay for nursing is is vital for recruitment and for retention. But I wanted to know first of all what plans are in place to dramatically increase the staffing levels um, and what has been done to train up others to support nursing roles and free up nurses uh, in order to return to theatre work so that elective care can resume um, urgently. That's my first question. Thanks. Um, Thank you. Um, with regards to uh, nursing workforce, uh, and I suppose one of the underpinning uh, tenants of our elective care reform it is expanding the skills mix um, and also ensuring that people are, are treated right place, uh, right, you know, right time by the right individuals. So we have been working on enhancing both uh, experienced nursing, so creating the advanced nurse practitioners, but we've also been looking in the areas, if we go back to the operative setting, looking at our operating department practitioners. So they are effectively the runners um, in the theatres and actually releasing theatre nursing to do purely nursing duties within theatres. So we have a small number of operating practitioners, uh, operating department practitioners in a number of sites uh, and we as an elective care cell um, would be targeting um, that going forward to support theatre nurses. Um, I think the chief nursing officer was with you a couple of weeks ago and had indicated the number of vacancies um, and you're aware of the uh, increase, significant increase in pre-registration training uh, and un midwifery university places. I think they've gone up uh, from 710 to some 1300 since 2016. So we are enhancing the pure numbers uh, of nurses coming through the system. But we're, we're also looking at expanding all skills mix, including if we look at our radiology departments, including the enhanced skills and practitioners of radiographers uh, and moving to consultant radiographers to make sure that we actually aren't missing a trick anywhere in any of our professions to fully support uh, the workforce and build capacity and capability in order to address demand. Chair, can I come in briefly? Hopefully uh, members can hear me this time. As well, and Lisa, Lisa we can hear you, Alistair, yeah, go ahead. Great. Just to add briefly to what Lisa said, so obviously the main issue around workforce is time. So it will take time to increase the workforce. We know we need to, but um, it, it takes time to train them and it, takes, it can take years for them to come through. So that's not going to be a rapid fix at all. The other point I just wanted to make was uh, that there is a piece of work happening under the Chief Nursing Officer being led by Mary Hines on perioperative nursing and the model for that. So that work is happening now, which is looking at different models and different roles within the theatre teams. Okay, thank you, Alistair. And Pam, 
yeah thank you chair and thank you for those responses there um um and obviously the as a department um the department's elective care plan focuses heavily on transformation and reform uh, including the one billion financial commitment to address waiting times for elective care and given the clear pressures on the public services as we chart the covid recovery is there a plan b um, in the interim to, to promote better outcomes using the resources that are available and could you also tell us um, what plans if any have to utilize the independent sector in in the short term We're not hearing you, Lisa. Lisa. Apologies, Lisa, Chair. We're is not that hearing it? You there? Yeah. Yep. Hear sorry. You Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, I, I was just indicating, Pam, if I start, but Alistair may wish to uh, supplement that. Uh, with regards to the indication of the funding, the £750 to a billion pounds that we have costed both the backlog um, and the capacity gap, uh, there is an acknowledgement that you know that requires the workforce uh, to actually be able to deliver, but also hospital infrastructure. Uh, and we are aware of the budgetary position, which for 2021-22 uh, is unlikely to have um, an investment in elective care in that scale. Uh, we already have... Um, an indication in advance of the budget uh, of a small amount of elective funding, which has enabled us to continue with the IS provision uh, into April, May and June, because otherwise we would be switching that small amount of capacity off. Um, the, we intend um, to fully utilise all capacity available as part of the new decade, new approach uh, that was previously published. There was a uh, indication that we would be seeking to send uh, our longest way potentially to uh, UK uh, in, uh, providers uh, in order to address our longest waits, enabling the system to focus on our um, critical and time critical um, uh, individuals uh, here. Uh, unfortunately, with the COVID, that has closed some of that available capacity down because England uh, now have a situation where they also have long waits and one in 20 will be waiting more than a year for treatment and surgery in England. That said, we have, uh, and Paul's team in commissioning and contracting in the board, have uh, an agreement with NHS England's framework to actually draw from the IS providers within the English system, uh, allowing us to access the IS capacity both in England. Um, we have a continued uh, contacts with the IS in Northern Ireland and then also in ROI. So we are, um, we have provision for surgical, some cardiac uh, and a number of other pre uh, procedures in ROI that we will be continuing uh, subject to the funding will determine the scale of that. But there is an anticipation we will continue uh, to utilise the IS. Uh, and I don't know if Alistair wants to supplement that. Thanks, Lisa. Yeah, so there's three other areas, I suppose, worth mentioning. One is um, obviously with Lagan Valley now operating as a regional um, day case elective care centre. It's been slightly different function throughout the pandemic than we'd expected initially because it has had to take on um, additional urgent procedures and red flag procedures rather than being the day case site it was uh, intended to be. I think as we go back into more like normal business, it will become a regional day case site. And we're hoping that will be more efficient because it will be a completely dedicated elective site than, than current models. Also, we'd hope to expand that model in, in future to other sites which can become regional elective site, um, day case sites. Uh, second point then is around orthopaedics. So it has been incredibly um, hard hit during the pandemic and waiting times were already very bad before the pandemic as well. And it's obviously an area which impacts a huge amount of people across Northern Ireland and um, is an area where demand is increasing every year as well with our aging population. So we've set up an orthopaedic network, which is currently looking firstly at how we rebuild, but then also how we improve efficiency around the system. So different pathways, different ways of working, new models of care, skills mix, all those kinds of things. So we want that to be um, up and running pretty much uh, in the next two or three months. So we know it's already reporting, but we want to have some more product out of it so we can start to change the way things are done. And then allied to that's the point Lisa mentioned about Musgrave Park, which really needs to become a dedicated elective orthopaedic site and needs to be protected with the staff and the theatres protected for elective. So we get, it does about two thirds of the elective activity for orthopaedics in Northern Ireland. We really need it doing that. Um, in the pandemic, it was reduced to providing one theatre list. I think it was one day's theatre capacity per week as opposed to the normal 10. So we need to get back up to the 10 as quickly as we can. And then the final point, 
which actually um, is probably an answer to um, Pam's question previously that I forgot to mention, is around to know more silos work. So we are very aware definitely that there will be people presenting as emergencies or later stage in this and then maybe presenting through urgent or other unscheduled pathways. So the no more silos work is intended to provide a faster way for patients to access that as opposed to simply just going through an emergency department. It's supposed to be better links between primary care and secondary care and smoother ways for people to access the care they need as opposed to spending a long time on trolleys. So all three of those together are immediate actions we want to take to try and improve the, the way we're dealing with patients at the moment. Okay, thank you. And um, I just will will just, we are fairly tight for time this morning. So I'll ask all members to keep questions fairly succinct, please. And also if we can have a, a principal answer from the panel and uh, if there's additional information to be added, that's that's also fine. But if we can, I'll just ask everyone to keep it as succinct as possible. So I'm going to uh, Paula Bradshaw. Paula, go ahead, please. Um, thank you, Chair, and thank you, panel. And my first question I, I put to the Royal College of Surgeons yesterday, and that was around the um, regional prioritisation list, and I'm glad they support the approach to, um, adopted by the department. And I, I got the um, indication that they think that it would probably be easier if we had one trust here in Northern Ireland as opposed to five. And, and is there, so my question really is whether the Department of Health, through the sort of transformation implementation process, are possibly looking at that. So, Alistair, I wonder if you would take that, please. Yeah, I'm happy to take that. So there, there's a definite um, way of thinking that regionalization is definitely the way we need to go for a lot of specialist services. So um, there's lots of services where we, it's not so much that we're, it's partly that we're maybe trying to provide some of them in too many places, but it's mainly that we're trying to provide them as separate services when really there should be regional services for a lot of these areas. So whether or not it's, uh, it's one single trust or multiple trusts, I think is less important than these being managed on a regional basis. So uh, an area, just um, if you'll bear with me for one moment, Chair, I don't want to go into too much like, detail on this, but the, um, the breast assessment work we did previously. So the main issue there is that whenever one service on one site falls over, it's treated as one separate service as opposed to all the other services really picking up the demand that is out there. And secondly, in areas like that, whenever we are recruiting, Quite often we are recruiting from other trusts into a trust where there's a vacancy. So in effect, we're just pushing the vacancy around Northern Ireland. So all of those are definitely much better suited to having the regional approach. So rather than be going into the governance issues around one trust versus other, I think I could definitely say we are looking at regional services and a regional approach to planning these services. Um, thank you. It's very encouraging. I suppose the, the other issue that was raised yesterday was really around how um, targets are measured and the waiting lists are measured. I'm not seeking for you to start massaging the figures or anything, but is there any work ongoing about how to better percent the severity of, of those who are waiting on the list? Because I think it's very difficult for us to really get our head around the 324,000 or whatever the number is that are waiting. So is there any work on that? Thank you. Uh, Paula, I suppose it's not, not necessarily connected straight to changing a, a target per se, but the work out of necessity that we've had to do through the regional prioritisation has required an extensive look at the totality of the waiting lists in order to understand the cancer in the time critical. So the regional prioritisation oversight group uh, on a weekly basis looks at those individuals who have just finished chemotherapy or radiotherapy and therefore have a very short window, sometimes seven days for surgery. Uh, it captures those with uh, confirmed cancer who have a, a month to have treatment uh, and those with the suspect who require an urgent diagnostic day case procedure. Uh, but it also captures our most complex benign cases. So we're not excluding it purely to cancer because quite often uh, cardiac vascular, uh, those individuals could actually have a more time critical pressing factor. So we I have a system now that has looked at the at that cohort within our treatment weights. Um, so it doesn't it's not necessarily to drive a target, but it actually allows us to target resource more appropriately uh, and be clear on uh, what our waiting lists contain. But it also is important because it's the only way that we can equalize uh, capacity across trust to make sure that we are not relying on a postcode lottery. So it's not per se to change targets, but it is absolutely to understand what's on the waiting list and which cohort are, are most likely to come to harm in which time frames. Uh, so it's not on targets, but it is about informing how we match capacity with demand. 
Okay, thank you. And finally, quickly, it's in relation to the deterioration of people's conditions while they are on the waiting list. And as you know, a lot of people would have comorbidities. Um, so maybe while they're waiting and they're quite down and maybe they've got a mobility issues and this might have an impact on their dementia, for example. So I'm just wondering about how we're treating patients in their totality while they're on their waiting list to make sure that whenever they do get to the operating um, or the, the table or the consultant, that they're not in a far worse position than could be with intervention. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Paula. And, and I suppose there's two sides to that. There's the emotional health and well-being of patients who are, are maybe dealing with pain and discomfort. And there's also the perioperative, making sure that people are still fit and have the support once they get a treatment date. So I suppose there's two strands to that. Uh, if, if I start with the emotional um, and sort of mental health and well-being, we have developed a number of online resources uh, and teams through necessity have enhanced their crisis response um, and their mental health liaison in, in the likes of the uh, urgent treatment centres um, and also EDs to try and make sure that we are supporting as best as possible. Um, unfortunately, the move that we've taken to uh, virtual outpatients isn't suitable for all cohorts. Uh, and if you think of dementia patients, a virtual consultation isn't necessarily suitable for our dementia uh, or cohort of dementia patients. So actually the teams sift through very carefully uh, and then ensure that they are receiving the face-to-face. -face. However, we have had to reduce our face-to-face -face, uh, contact due to spatial um, and social distancing. So the teams are keeping an eye on those individuals. Uh, with regards to the peri perioperative work, I think we're at the start of that journey, uh, particularly with the cancer patients uh, and a very dedicated focus on that going forward as part of the cancer strategy, because clearly uh, there is evidence if people are really fit for surgery, they recover much quicker, their length of stay is shorter, um, and they get the benefit of their treatment much quicker. So we're at the start of a journey um, with regards to that sort of perioperative enhancement. Uh, what I would say is for orthopedics, we have been doing enhanced recovery for some time, even in advance of COVID, where patients are fully briefed in terms of if you're having a knee or hip, here are the exercises we want you to do now. You know, be clear, you will have, you know, 23 hour length of stay or one, you know, one night length of stay, we will be getting you up within two hours. And th these are the exercises we need you to undertake in order to recover quickly. So we do have models of that, um, but it's going to be key going forward. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to Cara. Go ahead, Cara, please. It's Cara Hunter. Sorry, there was a delay in, in unmuting there. Thank you all for being here today. Um, this kind of uh, falls into my question, uh, which is just around uh, mental health. Uh, can the panel give a picture of waiting lists and times uh, for mental health services currently? Uh, and I know that as a result of the pandemic, we kind of foresee increased need. And Paula touched on a fantastic point there around um, following our discussion with surgeons yesterday on those who are living with chronic pain um, some feel as though they're living unfulfilling lives while waiting on things like hip replacements. Um, so obviously that would have a psychological impact as well. So I'm just wondering, does the panel have an assessment in what is needed to address both uh, staffing uh, and this issue with waiting lists in terms of finance? Thank you. Um, thank you, Cara. Uh, with regards to mental health, the, there is a mental health action plan that picks up on the workforce issues and the requirement to, uh, similar to elective, actually reform the way that services are delivered uh, and in particular building on previous reviews. So departmental colleagues and trust colleagues uh, are working through that uh, mental health action plan. Uh, if I can pick up your point with regards to uh, pain and people living with pain whilst they're waiting for treatment, um, there are a number of um, pain management uh, resources uh, and we, we uh, as part of the electric care uh, plan, had instigated a lot of um, sort of musculoskeletal pain management services and support to ensure that those, you know, surgery is not going to be the answer for everybody experiencing pain, but actually to actually enable people to manage their pain without an over-dependency on drugs uh, and particular types of drugs. So uh, our pharmacy colleagues uh, in, in the board have been doing a huge amount of work on that pain, pain management and supporting individuals. And I'm sure we would be happy after this meeting to provide further information because I just wouldn't have it at hand. 
Um, but the uh, mental health um, action plan is the blueprint for actually, um, and there is an element of regionalization back to Alistair's point, uh, not a single trust, but a regional approach to mental health, because actually that will remove the postcode lottery and the variation in practice, and also the variation in staffing models, mm -hmm. because where we have the biggest weights is it, it can be tied back to the number of staff vacancies. Mm -hmm. um, and we have seen some improvement in our adult mental health weights um, over the last number of months, particularly in the Western Trust, which had a large cohort because they were very successful in recruiting uh, to vacancies, but also looking at skills uh, and skills mix changes within their model. So I think the mental health plan actually underpins all of that. Okay, thank, thank you, Lisa. Um, that was a really good answer. Thank you. I, I'm just looking here. Um, we I think it was Alistair who touched on it, on new models of care. And, and I'm just wondering, can you outline any innovative ways that are currently being used um, or that are being explored to try and overcome the waiting list issue? Just any kind of pilot programs or anything creative that's been done? Thank you. Sure. Um, Cara, if I pick up on one that we've been uh, using this year, which is the fit testing that we've been using uh, in all trusts. It, it's a test that uh, following a GP referral to secondary care for a suspect colorectal cancer following a bleed uh, or, or in compliant with the guidance, the uh, clinical team triage it and then they will issue a fit test to that individual. Now that fit, fit test is then returned and it's a pathological examination uh, of the uh, results of it. Uh, we had always wanted to move fit testing into primary care as a way of uh, being clear which patients needed to join the red flag pathway. But during COVID, because the colonoscopies were considered such a high risk um, for, um, for uh, you know, their an aerosol generating procedure, we actually had to switch back all of our colonoscopies up until the most, ur you know, the truest urgent. So we've been using the FIT test to actually prioritize those individuals who must have a colonoscopy. Um, and despite, you know, a 30% reduction in uh, colorectal referrals into the system um, and 50% reduction in endoscopy, the FIT test has resulted in comparable pathology reports of about 85% compared to the full year previously. So it demonstrates the, the benefits. Um, so we, we're, we're not going to lose that. Uh, so we did it out of necessity, but we absolutely intend with our colleagues in the public health agency to move that to primary care uh, because we've allowed it a tried and tested and we were able to do it probably in a much quicker fashion uh, than we would have been doing if we were bringing in as a new uh, new technology. So hopefully that's a good example of a, an opportunity that actually is of huge benefit to patients, but it also means that we're allocating capacity to those that truly need it, mm -hmm. as opposed to those that would automatically get a colonoscopy, but there's, you know, there was no, no requirement necessarily for them to have it. Thank you. That's great, Lisa. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thank you, Cara. And then, so in, in the following order, then I'm going to Carol, Nikhil, and then Jonathan, then Jerry, and then Orlea. So I'll go then to Carol. Go ahead, Chair, thank, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Lisa, Paul and Alistair for this morning. Um, so the questions I have are in relation to in 2017, the department produced its elective care plan, um, waiting list crisis needing anything from 750 million to 1 billion to tackle waiting lists, and it would likely take up to 10 years. So um, I just want your views on that. And that was obviously pre-COVID. And again, like other members have referred to, we met with the the surgeons, yes, the consultant surgeons yesterday, and they were pains to point out that retention, more so than recruitment, or as well as recruitment of staff, was critical. So you've already mentioned, you know, there are gaps and the waiting lists are more intense where those gaps appear. Um, it's just to get your update on that. And then my final thing is in relation to um, the independent sector, um, it strikes me that while money will be spent to tackle the waiting lists, we're actually literally um, we're going around full circle because unless we get to the bottom of re re the retention and indeed recruitment of staff that are needed in order to have these in-house facilities, then we're going to constantly come back to this. And the issue around, you know, the way in which the intensivists and the ICU staff from different hospitals have went to Nightingale and some are coming back. Have you any idea what that looks like per 
trust. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. If I maybe start uh, and uh, pick up a couple of those points before turning to colleagues. Uh, the elective care plan in 2017, uh, the, the board did the financial assessment in terms of uh, backlog, costing backlog, but also the capacity gap. Um, that was updated in the in the two months before the pandemic started. Uh, so in doing that, um, what we were clear on is that the backlog had increased by about 100 million. Uh, capacity gap, um, when you did the pure number assessment, hadn't increased, but that was largely because patients weren't getting through the system. So, um, and that, that is prior to COVID. Now we uh, know the downturn in referrals uh, that have taken place uh, during the COVID pandemic. So again, we don't have a true picture of capacity. Um, the 750 million to a billion always had an element of additional staffing and infrastructure uh, and space within that. So our best assessment is that we are still in that, in that range. What has changed is we previously had said it would take five to 10 years to address the scale of the weights. Um, I think our assessment, uh, both in the board and the department, is it'll be towards the latter end of that time frame now, uh, and it will take us longer. Uh, which does connect to your point about, you know, the the IS approach is always the approach in in the short run with short term funding to um, address backlog, but doesn't actually ever address capacity. And if we don't address capacity in parallel. We clear one backlog, but we're automatically adding a patient to that backlog all over again. Um, so whilst we uh, will always accept non-recurrent and it's always welcome, it does only address backlog for a period of time and it, it does require that investment in the capacity gap to actually keep us uh, moving forward. Um, with regards to the retention of staff, the COVID experience of staff has absolutely had an impact on uh, staff, emotional health and well-being uh, and people being displaced. Uh, and there will be a time for people to, uh, and there may be some um, post-traumatic um you know, instances that will need to be supported uh, through our occupational health and through our trust management teams working with staff closely. Uh, and clearly what our clinicians tell us is they want to be able to do their job. They want to be able to treat patients. They want to be proud of their service. So getting elective switch back on and, um, it, you know, taking their learning of the things that will actually make a difference and listening to patients actually has a huge impact on increasing morale and morale increasing in effect also helps retention. Uh, but Alistair may want to pick up whether the department are doing anything specifically in retention from a policy side, because I'm sorry, I wouldn't have that information. So it does, um, it links to even before COVID, I think the, the main thing people want is to be able to go in and do their job and then leave whenever they've done their shift. And, you know, they, they, what we're trying to do in elective care centres is part of that. You know, you're in, you see your first patient immediately, you work until it's time to leave and then you go home. And that's the experience we sometimes hear from people who've gone to other countries, you know, is that they know what they work and when they finish their working day, they finish their working day. That's where we want to get to. Um, but it will, it will take time to do this properly because it's going to take investment over a long period. So what I would say about the investment is we've been in this position, similar position, um, not quite as bad, in around 2005. And we did get the waiting list down over about four years until they were in, at acceptable levels. But we did focus a great deal on additionality and non-recurrent funding because that was the funding we had available. Um, and if we do the same again, we will end up in the same position again, that we'll get the waiting list down to an acceptable level and then they'll continue to grow again. So I think we're looking at a long-term period, period where we need to start it with funding additionality and in-house because that's where the capacity will be. But over time, we have to turn that into recurrent funding and increase capacity in-house if we want to keep this as a sustainable improvement. So that's definitely the direction we need to go. But it will, if you think of it like scales in terms of what's recurrent and non-recurrent, I think it starts off where you're looking at additionality and then over time that becomes your in-house capacity, but you need the sustained investment. And maybe just to, to pick up on the final question, uh, Chair, if that's okay, just in terms of, of Nightingale. Nightingale, at the, at the height of the, the most recent surge, Carol, has uh, had 40 beds in total, of which eight of those, I suppose, were, were what we would call regional beds. So that was, it, they, I suppose, to keep pace, because obviously a lot of beds were there for Belfast patients as well. And staff came from all over Northern Ireland. And unfortunately, I don't have the, the, the numbers to hand, Carol, but happy to, to follow up on that if you wish. Uh, but a, a, quite a number of staff came from all of the 
the other four trusts, indeed additional staff from within Belfast Trust to support uh, the 40 beds in, in Nightingale, and particularly those additional uh, what we call pods uh, in terms of the, the Nightingale. Uh, and those staff have now re been redeployed back to their, their home trust, but certainly, again, their, their efforts have been well recognised, I think, in recent months. Okay. Thank you. I'm going then. Sorry, Chair. Go check it. We had to travel for from. Yeah. Okay. I'm going then to Jonathan Buckley. Go ahead, Jonathan. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, panel. Uh, waiting times have been an issue that has been a long time paramount concern for me, both pre-COVID and now exacerbated via COVID. And to be honest, there was statistics released in December are harrowing and highlight the scale of the challenge facing our health service as you've outlined in your report. And I think it is important that we, we note those statistics because they're people. Over half of patients were waiting more than 52 weeks for a first consultant-led outpatient appointment and another 57,000 waiting for more than 26 weeks for a diagnostic test. You know, the, those, those figures are scary. And there's and they're real life stories. That's that's the sad thing behind each statistic is a real life. It's a person. Uh, there needs to be a recognition that a single track focus on COVID nineteen, particularly as transmission drops, is a threat to fairness and equality within our health service. I have listened to first hand accounts as an elected representative of late presentations and advanced cancers that are showing up as a result because they have not been picked up. Uh, in, a part, in part due to the pandemic. Um, you know, I, I look at this, and in particular about cancer, about two-thirds of those waiting, just over 95,000, are waiting for a test that could be help, used to help diagnose cancer, an endoscopic or an imaging test, waiting for a test that could possibly tell you that you have cancer in general is stressful, but to be told that it could be a six-month waiting list is even worse. So firstly, can anybody provide figures of how many endoscopic and imaging procedures are planned to take place uh, in the IS going forward and how long the IS capacity has been secured for? That's the first one. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, uh, thank you John. Sorry. Oh, oh. Sorry, well, I was actually going to say you probably have more, much more of the detail around the um, endoscopies and, and all of that, but I'll, I'll just start with the, the wider post. I think it is important to, to say that we are not prioritizing COVID over any other conditions. What we're prioritizing is unscheduled presentations. So anyone who turns up at the hospital requiring urgent or emergency care needs to receive that care. And there's, I don't think there's any way around that. You can't turn people away who need urgent emergency care. So what we've been talking about is scaling up our hospitals and scaling up our ICU to deal with the people who need this urgent and emergency care. And unfortunately, that does inevitably have an impact on our scheduled services. So our main way to get through that is to keep the COVID levels low because the COVID numbers do translate into increased requirement for hospital admissions, increased requirement for ICU admissions. So it's that that we need to avoid. It's We're not talking about prioritising one condition over another. At all. Alistair, I, I'm not saying that you are, but it, there is no doubt it was presented to us by trust officials and first-hand accounts that there is a fear, a genuine fear, that late presentations at A&E &E because of the pandemic and because of COVID has led to an increase in those cancers that are at advanced stage and can't be dealt with. We're hearing that only also in relation to GP services as well. So it's a genuine concern that I have and other members have that we need to take account of. No, it's, it's absolutely genuine and I absolutely agree. It really is. I mean, it's, it's very worrying, but it was more just, a, I didn't want anyone to have the sense that we were prioritizing in areas over others. It's purely that if people arrive at the hospital and need treatment, we need to be in a position to provide that to them. But I absolutely agree, it has a huge impact across the board and that's something we really need to focus on now. Um, the other issue was just around, the, you mentioned about the challenge for the health sector and I absolutely agree with that as well, but I think perhaps it's even more than that. No, I think this is a challenge for the public sector in general at the minute. It's that serious, I think, is an issue because as well as a physical impact and a health impact, there is a mental impact, there's a social impact and there's an economic impact of these issues. So I think this is a huge challenge for all of us in the public sector going forward. Okay, is anybody, if somebody hasn't got those figures to hand right now in relation to the numbers, I'm happy for you to supply that to me. Is that Lisa? 
Yeah, uh, sorry, Jonathan. What I would say is we, we have at least two providers that we have consistently used to enhance uh, endoscopy capacity, um, to enhance our in-house capacity over the last two years. Uh, and actually, they have really stepped, those two IS providers have stepped up um, and are doing insourcing in some of our facilities where the infrastructure is available, but the staffing isn't. So those two companies, we have been using them extensively uh, through the pandemic response. Uh, and, we, and we envisage continuing to use those going forward. So one of the providers, by way of example, um, you know, is committing to doing 250 scopes for the esophagogastric um, and there are other scopes being provided. So those two providers we foresee using going forward. Um, we had used them to enhance uh, as an additionality to the in-house, but they have been able to use our facilities and our equipment um, when our staffing hasn't been available over the last uh, nine months. Okay, and the fit, the fit triage uh, too that you'd mentioned, that's exciting. Just want to ensure that the funding's secured for that. And finally, I know because time is tight, uh, I welcome the creation of a, a regional prioritization oversight group. And I certainly see a need for that joined up working. The Southern Trust area, which I represent, for example, has the largest proportion of weights over six months for a diagnostic test. Can we, how can we ensure that our approach uh, to restoring the lack of services is fair and doesn't indirectly lead to further inequalities across our communities. Uh, Jonathan, we have a uh, radiology network that has taken on uh, a responsibility of uh, equalizing diagnostic weights. So whilst it's not possible to have a single waiting list because we use different systems for diagnostic, particularly imaging, the uh, managing radiology network has treated that as a regional list and have been moving resource around. And you'll be aware um, that under the NHS supply agreement uh, for COVID, we received uh, an additional CT scanner. Um, which a uh, scanner in a box that we placed in Musgrave that all trusts utilize. Uh, so it's not a Belfast resource, it is a resource for the region. Um, and we have received additional um, um, X-ray and ultrasound equipment, but our managed radiology network has, has made great efforts in equalizing weights. So that again, uh, similar to the regional prioritization, they look at the weights and they look at available capacity and they move the trust access around, including the Southern Trust, but they do it on the basis of chronological and uh, clinical priority. So there is a, a, an extensive piece of work in that area. Okay. Th thank you. And just you can maybe come back on the point about FIT securing funding uh, whenever. It doesn't have to happen now, but if you, if you want to comment. Yep. No problem. I will do. Yep. Thanks, Jerry. So going then to Jerry. Thank you, Jonathan. Going to Jerry Carroll. Go ahead, Jerry. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, panel. Um, first question is around uh, the issue and relating to uh, private healthcare providers in terms of helping manage the lists. Um, I believe that this is uh, an unsustainable, but also a uh, unregulated uh, model. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you why. Um, we, I got a figure from the Department of Health uh, saying that uh, in a three month period last year, 10 million pounds was spent in relation to three private providers around specific care. Um, and I think um, Lisa mentioned 4,600 people were, were seen by private uh, consultants, um, presumably in, in private uh, hospitals. Um, so uh, what they ask, what is the um, cost to uh, the public in, re in relation to the reliance on the uh, private uh, healthcare model? And also I'm concerned that I asked a question last year um, about the number of uh, private hospital uh, beds and capacity, and I was told that I couldn't get an answer uh, because it would, it's too, um, it would be too costly to, to, to find out that, that answer. So I'm really concerned that we're throwing uh, public money at a model that is uh, unstable, unfair, and more expensive in the long run, and also reinforcing the two-tier healthcare model, whereas you can get treatment if you can afford to go private, or if you can't, you're, you're uh, waiting on a wait waiting list for a long time. So that would be my first question. Thanks. Uh, 
Thanks, Jerry. If I if I could start with the um, payments to the three private uh, independent sector hospitals uh, and the ten million pounds that you reference uh, it, at the very start of the pandemic, when we effectively stopped outpatient and uh, surgical services, we did have a, a head of terms agreement uh, that went through both legal and probity, uh, and we had external auditors to actually take over the totality of the infrastructure, their theatre nurses, um, and their employed an, an anaesthetist and the HSE tra- uh, employed consultants travelled to treat patients. So we ended up having an outpatients and day case and inpatient uh, capacity from those three providers. So we had that arrangement in place. Um, but we have, um, as we've come out of, particularly at the end of surge one, as we went into surge two, those private providers we're starting to see an increase in their own private demand. Um, and, and actually, we were moving away from the totality of the need of their um, facilities. So since then, we have been buying uh, on a session, theatre session basis. So we're only paying for when a patient uh, from the HSE is treated in a theatre um, in the IS. And that has been the arrangement uh, from June to to date. Uh, so we're buying theatre sessions um, in accordance with um, the tariff arrangements that we would have in place. But there is a high level of scrutiny. And as I indicate, there was a um, external auditor who has gone through every element of the um, heads of terms agreement and the claims from those three providers. And we had excluded elements that we didn't f- feel were justified. So there, ha- if I can give you some assurance that there has been a high level of scrutiny scrutiny and probity on that. Uh, But the move to theatre sessions is a much better value for money uh, approach for us. Um, Now, your point with regards to uh, the commercial information of those providers in terms of the number of beds available, um, we would have some of that information through the heads of terms, but but Paul will advise, I think it probably is still of commercial sensitive uh, nature. But the auditors certainly had that information, and we're doing the cost uh, benefit analysis against that. Yeah, for that for that that initial period, Lisa, that kind of April to June 2020, Jerry would be the period when we'd have that information when we had, as Lisa says, effectively taken the, the hospitals over for our uses. But since then, it's been a much more sessional approach. Thanks, and I appreciate everybody sure that information can be shared with the committee, both in terms of capacity and the, the agreement uh, last year. Just uh, finally, um, has there been a, an assessment of the, the impact of the, the 1% uh, pay offer? I know it's NHS England, but um, we were still waiting on a, an offer to be made to healthcare workers and nurses here in terms of how that could impact uh, on people, uh, on retention, people remaining. And also, um, I, I've asked this question and haven't received a, a a sort of a, a proper answer, if you will. Um, we we have um, people who are asylum seekers, who are refugees, and who have unsecure uh, immigration statuses, who are doctors, who are healthcare workers. And, and as, uh, to me, I think those people uh, aren't being uh, looked at, aren't being targeted uh, to try and um, pull them into the, um, the healthcare uh, system. So do we have a sense of how many numbers uh, that would be in terms of people who are uh, refugees, asylum seekers, and other uh, variations of um, sort of unsecure migra- um, immigrant status who are trained healthcare workers but are unable to work uh, because of the, the immigration archaic immigration laws. Thanks. Uh- Jerry, unless Alistair has an answer to this, I, I think we might have to refer to our workforce policy leads in the department um, for the uh, information with regards to the asylum seekers and uh, refugees who um, we could be utilising as healthcare workers. So if, if the committee is happy, we'll uh, link with departmental colleagues and come back. Uh, with regards to the um, 1% pay rise, um, because the offer has been made to England, I suppose there's lots of speculation, but we haven't actually had an offer. Um, and, and until we actually actually have uh, an offer of pay. I'm not sure that there's been any work uh, scaling the, uh, I suppose, how that will be received or what the impact would be. But Alistair will correct me if I'm wrong in that. No, that's absolutely right, Lisa. I think we'd have to refer that to our colleagues in the workforce policy uh, on, this, on those, both of those issues. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, I just want to pick up on a point that Jerry made there around the issue of the number of beds in the independent sector being used. I don't understand why that would be commercially sensitive. This is public health budgeting going to private uh, providers. Now, I can understand that there may be commercial sensitivity around the amounts of money being spent, 
But I also don't think that should be concealed from the public either, whether it's commercially, it may be embarrassing, it may be concerning, maybe many things, but I don't think it's acceptable that we don't know how many beds we're talking about. I don't see even a commercial sensitivity in that issue, to be honest, Lisa. Uh, so I'm I think we would like to see that in yeah, and Chair, apologies yeah. if, I, if I've been, uh, if I've misled in any way. We know the number of beds utilised and the number of days that the patients utilise those beds. So we absolutely have that information uh, and we'll absolutely share that as we're coming back, um, particularly for that first period and also uh, any of the information that would provide a different a diff- additional assurance from our auditors on that. So no uh, apologies if I've been misled, if I've misled you in that. Okay, okay. And and I also just will also reference, I was concerned earlier when you said there was two independent sector providers who we will be moving. And I think the quote you said, we will be using going forward. I certainly hope there's no reliance on a longer term basis, that this is only a stopgap and that all the planning efforts are going into how we unwind and bring those back into the public, into the public realm. Okay. Okay, thank you. I'll go then to Orlea and then I'll, I'll finish with Alan. So Orlea Flynn, please. Uh, thank you, Chair, and <clears throat> thanks to the panel um, for coming today. Um, I First of all, um, Lisa, I was wondering, I know Carl touched on this a bit with you earlier on, around the, the amount of money um, that's required to sort of tackle this ongoing long-term challenge, so the 750 million to a billion. Um, and you had referenced that 100 million of that um, was around capacity. Um, but would you have a full breakdown, Lisa, of so those costs that are required to deal <clears throat> with this issue? Do you have a, 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 a detailed breakdown of, you know, um, how much needs to go towards whether it be capacity or hospital infrastructure or workforce, etc.? cetera? Um, or, or Leah, thank you. Um, cause- we provided, uh, following the February briefing 2020, uh, an indication of that, but we will update that because clearly our backlog costs have increased. So we would be happy to come back with that breakdown. And I suppose when we talk about the backlog and the capacity, we have modelled that on uh, at specialty level. Um, so we understand demand uh, and we understand what our commission volumes actually are, but also understand what the waiting lists are. Um, so there will be a process of uh, rebalance as we start getting all the appropriate referrals into the system, uh, because that's currently not a true picture um, in terms of our outpatient gap, but we can certainly provide that information. That's that's great, Lisa. Thanks very much for that. And um, I'm just conscious I need to leave six minutes for Alan. So just finally, um, you had mentioned earlier around the um, so the use of the independent sector and that um, there will be a number of patients will be able to uh, receive their treatment via um, the south of Ireland, via England. And then obviously, whatever resources you have here locally in the north with the independent sector. And I'm just wondering, Lisa, do you have any sort of figures or forecasts? Um, you had mentioned the months between April to June for some of those referrals. Do you have a forecast of how many patients we're talking about that might be able to receive their treatment via those those referral routes? Um, or Leah, at this stage, we have the totality of those that have been treated to date and what we anticipate by the 31st of March, because th- that's in line with the contracts that we currently have. Uh, going forward into 21-22, uh, uh, we have an indication of what IS capacity will be utilising in the next four weeks, uh, because it's dependent on the available funding. Uh, that said, um, the arrangement with NHS England for their IS gives a lot of scope um, and it'll be the uh, timing uh, and the appropriateness of, of patients travelling either down to down south or um, via ferry or plane to England with the COVID uh, restrictions. So w- we have an indication of what capacity might be available, but not a firm number of patients because that will be depending on the available funds uh, and, and the scale of that. Okay, and sorry, because I know I haven't took the, the full six minutes, just quickly, I forgot to mention, on the workforce appeal, um, Lisa, I know that there wasn't a great uptake that Charlotte McCardle was saying to us the other week, there was about 300, 400 places out of a total of 9,000 expressions of interest, 5,000 formal applications. Is the department and the board, are you just looking at any options to try and utilise that workforce appeal to try and help you in the coming weeks and months? 
Uh, yes, Orlea, and I think the, the one of the drivers that will help that is the move to the green or COVID light sites, because we know that there are uh, there are people who are recent retires from the surgical operative theatre nursing that actually may um, be willing to come back in that workforce appeal if they're guaranteed not to be exposed, you know, not to be in a, in a site where they may become exposed by COVID. Uh, so that green pathway, green site work um, is really important. At, and the messaging associated in any workforce appeal is likely to uh, be welcomed, uh, is our understanding from our trade union colleagues. Okay. Okay. Thank, thank you, Arlea. Just a, again, a very quick follow up on Arlea. Is one of the comments yesterday, Lisa, was to do with the the ECR, the electronic care record, which made it easier to make a referral to England rather than South. Um, so that brings with it the inherent additional difficulties and risks for families of travel. Do you recognise that? And is there anything being done to address that difficulty to allow transfer north-south maybe more readily? Uh, absolutely, Chair. Uh, and I suppose ultimately Encompass um, will fix some of those uh, and will be more of a streamlined approach, although Encompass has been impacted by COVID. Um, but the ROI providers that we uh, have been using uh, in recent months, um, there, there were always a historic arrangement uh, and the clinical teams um, and the management teams have a, have a streamless uh, or a streamlined approach for actually addressing that. It's not necessarily a touch of a button approach, but actually governance um, and information transfer is appropriate uh, because it's tried and tested, but encompass going forward um, and the links to both uh, UK systems and systems and ROI uh, will actually address that. Okay, thank you. And going there to Alan. Go ahead, Alan, please. Thank you, Chairman. I'll, I'll be quite brief. Uh, Chairman, it's, it's, it's easy, I suppose, to blame COVID for the, uh, the, the current waiting lists. Uh, and I certainly accept that it's, it's obvious that the, uh, it hasn't helped. Uh, but I think that what the pandemic has done is focus more attention on the capacity problems within the NHS. And I just wonder, would the panel agree that politically painful transformation is urgently needed? Uh, and there will be no overnight solutions to all our health service problems. And perhaps it's slightly misleading to suggest otherwise. Thank you. Uh, Alan, I, I, I couldn't agree more. COVID has, um, I suppose, made a situation worse, but the situation prior to COVID was already unacceptable for our waiting lists. Uh, people were already waiting too long uh, and our new decade, new approach um, made that very clear uh, and that is clearly before COVID. Uh, transformation, changing how we do things, changing the settings, changing the workforce um, is absolutely key, um, as well as making sure that we work with our other departments and other agencies to address uh, the, the socioeconomic impacts that we have on health. So we need to work with all of the agencies because uh, that's the only way we're going to address health inequality uh, and to promote a healthy lifestyle. So prevention is always going to be better uh, th than addressing um, disease presentation where possible. Um, so I don't think anyone would disagree with your statement, Alan. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so, listen, thank you very much, Lisa and Paul and Alistair, for your attendance today, for your answers in, in as far as you were able to on, on the large majority of them, and for your commitment that you provide the committee with uh, the further information that you didn't just have to hand. Um, I think it's, it's obviously a key concern now for the committee, and that, that rebuilding and, and a, a focus on those waiting lists is going to mean that we will be talking to you again in due course. But I want to wish you all the very best, and thank you all for attending. And Please take care of the next one. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Many, many thanks. Thank you. Okay. Okay, members. Um, I think that was that was a, a useful session in as far as it went, and I think it's an area that we certainly need to give more attention to. I think it'll need to be a priority for us actually moving forward. The, the Royal College has referred to agility, and I think we want to ensure that the department are, and trusts are being agile and that, that we ourselves will need to be similarly agile in, in order to keep a, a focus on this situation. But could I suggest that we will seek an update from both the department and the Royal College again in May to keep an eye on progress in, on all of this? Would members be content with that? Great. Sure. Okay. 
Yes, sure. Jerry. Yes, sure. I agree with that. Thanks. And uh, just in terms of those uh, information that we, we asked for, if we can try and get that before May. I mean, obviously, it's up to the department to, to bring those, but uh, that would be useful. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, thank you, members. I'm going to take another very, very quick break. Um, so could we return and be ready to go again promptly at 12.05? Thank you, members. And can you take us out of uh, public broadcasting, Kate? Yes, broadcasting. Could you go suspend for This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. That's us live now, Chair. Okay, thank you. Just one moment. Okay, members, thank you, and we're resuming now in, in uh, with, back with our meeting this morning. So our next item now is in relation to severe fetal impairment abortion amendment bill. In relation to this item and to read into the record, the committee voted under standing order 115 brackets 8 on the proposer of the bill's request for additional witnesses. I can confirm that a total of six mem votes were received in relation to that all content with the proposal. The following members voted in favour of that proposal. Myself, Pam Cameron, Alan Chambers, Cara Hunter, Carol Neekillen and Jonathan Buckley. I can advise members that the proposer of the Severe Fetal Impairment uh, Abortion Amendment Bill is here today to brief the committee on the principles of the bill. I refer members to a copy of the bill and the explanatory memorandum at tab 7.1 and 7.2 of the pack. Also included in your table pack at seven, tab 7.3 is a research paper on the bill produced by the Assembly's Research and Information Service. So um, can I now welcome Mr. Paul Given, MLA. Paul, are you able to hear us? Yes, Colin, Chairman, thank you. I, I can hear you clearly. Hopefully you can hear me okay. Yes, we're hearing you there. We're hearing you clearly okay. And also, Lynn Murray from Don't Screen Us Out. Lynn, are you there and can you hear us? Hold on. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we're hearing you, Lynn. Thank you. And you're welcome, very welcome to our committee. And Heidi Crowder from Don't Screen Us Out. Heidi, can you hear us okay? Hey, we can hear you. Can you hear us? Yes, yes, Heidi, we're hearing you there. Okay, yes, thank you very much. Okay, so without further ado, then I will invite uh, Paul Given to go ahead and give us a uh, brief us on the principles of this bill. Paul, please, thank you. Okay, well, th thank you, Colin. Um, I give you your proper title, Mr. Chairman, uh, and to members of the committee. Um, I just want to, I suppose, read this opening statement for the purposes of the record and then. And we, we'll get a contribution from Heidi and Lynn, and then more than happy to go into a, a question and answer session with members. But uh, first of all, can I just say that I'm very pleased to have been able to take this opportunity to come before the committee today uh, to provide an introductory presentation on the general principles of the Severe Fetal Impairment Abortion Amendment Bill. Uh, this bill has been inspired by the advocacy work of the Don't Screen Us Out campaign. And in particular, the testimony of Heidi Crowder, who is challenging the Abortion Act of 1967, which allows terminations on the basis of Down syndrome and other non-fatal disabilities up until birth. 
So I'm delighted that I have been joined today by both Heidi and Lynn Murray, uh, who is the director of the Don't Scream Us Out campaign, and I'll invite them uh, to speak after I've provided this overview of the bill. It was, of course, uh, Heidi's brave intervention in May last year, uh, calling on the Northern Ireland Assembly to make it clear that it rejected Westminster's regulations sanctioning abortion for non-fatal disabilities like her own up to birth. That resulted in the tabling of the motion and the vote which then took place on the 2nd of June. And on that day, in the course of two votes, there were 75 members of the Assembly voted to make it clear that they opposed abortion on the basis of non-fatal disabilities like Down syndrome up until birth. So, Mr Chairman, I agree with your colleague, Emma Sheeran, whenever she moved your party's amendment to the motion, and she said that to serve disabled people properly, we need to build infrastructure that is totally accessible. We need to have inclusivity to properly service Section 75 obligations across all public sector bodies and to raise awareness of the issues that face less able people in their daily life. Sinn Féin does not believe that a non-fatal abnormality is an appropriate criterion for an abortion. I hope that this committee will agree that it is discriminatory to provide a pre-born baby no protection in law because it has a non-fatal disability when a baby of exactly the same age is protected because they don't have a disability. Legislatively, this bill is very simple. It does not engage with any other aspect of abortion law. It simply makes it clear that there is no place for disability discrimination in Northern Ireland in 2021. Through this bill, there will be no grounds for an abortion on the basis that the baby has a non-fatal disability. Regulation 7.1b perpetuates falsehoods that have existed for too long in our society around a people with non-fatal disabilities such as Down syndrome, that they have less to contribute, that they are expendable and it encourages society to view these individuals as less valued than people who we describe as non-disabled. This sends out a message loud and clear, as Heidi has eloquently demonstrated, that the lives of people with disabilities are seen as less valuable, less worthy of protection than the lives of people without disability. To have a law which says in 2021, to have this law which says this in 2021 should be, in my view, completely unacceptable. And last June, I described this regulation as being years out of date and a regressive backward step in the campaign against discrimination and equality for people with disabilities. And that's why this bill has been tabled. This law is discriminatory. Disregard the last 30 years during which many people have campaigned and advocated for laws which aim to foster equality, ensuring that those with disabilities are treated equally to everyone else. Laws like the, the Disability Discrimination Act of 1995, protecting the rights of a person with disabilities, and the Northern Ireland Act of 1998, which places a statutory duty on public authorities to have due regard to the need to promote equality of opportunity for persons with disabilities. This committee will know that in 2006, the, Dis the Disability Discrimination Northern Ireland uh, Order further amended the Disability Discrimination Act of 1995 to include a requirement that public authorities promote positive attitudes to towards disabled persons. And furthermore, in 2009, the United Kingdom ratified the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. These laws reflect the fact that every person is of worth and value, a worth and value that should not be changed by the diagnosis of a disability. And I use that phrase, diagnosis of a disability, very uncomfortably, but because I know that does not sit well um, with people uh, that have Down syndrome to be referred to as having a diagnosis. Um, the committee will also know that in their report uh, on Great Britain and Northern Ireland, the UN committee stated that the committee is concerned about perceptions in society that stigmatise persons with disabilities and about the termination of pregnancy at any stage on the basis of fetal impairment. And the committee recommends that Great Britain amend its abortion law accordingly. So with that recommendation and the dis disability discriminatory legislation in Northern Ireland, how can we justify allowing laws like Regulation 7.1b to exist? Does it support pregnant women who are given the news that their much-wanted child may have a non-fatal disability? 
and there are too many difficult stories of parents feeling unsupported in these situations to continue with their pregnancy. Does this approach promote positive attitudes uh, towards disability and those who are disabled? I would like uh, the committee to, to consider the message that Regulation 71B sends to people like Heidi, who has Down syndrome, and to their friends and to their families. However, I do feel that Heidi is best placed to share that with you and the committee. This bill provides the Assembly with the opportunity to amend the regulation, the current regulation, and to send a clear message to people with a condition like Down syndrome, their family, friends and wider society, that Northern Ireland will not tolerate disability discrimination and that they are equally valued. So, Mr Chairman, I would like um, Heidi just to say a few words uh, and then Lynn, and that will just take another five minutes and then we're more than happy to, to go for questions if, if you're content, um, if, if Heidi can do that. And I just, I note her camera isn't switched on, so I'm sure we can hear her, but if she can put her camera on, that would be great. Thank you, thank you, Heidi. And that, this, this is Heidi's mum, Liz, who, who is with her just to support her uh, in this session. So, thank you, Heidi. If you if you were able to say a few words, that would be great. Thank you, Paul. Mr. Chairman, I would like to thank the Northern Ireland Assembly for voting last June to make it clear that you would get a person up to birth on the basis of disabilities, like mine, Down syndrome. I would also like to thank Paul Given for taking the lead in Northern Ireland by introducing the bill that Dick Swedish proposes to change the law to fit with the vote. The law in Great Britain, and now sadly in Northern Ireland, tell me and other people with Down syndrome that we are, that we are worth less than those without disabilities. Maybe people are even told that living with Down syndrome is too hard. Even if you don't believe me, research confirms that people with Down syndrome and their families are happy with their lives. And I'm one of them. That is why I want my voice to be heard and the law to be fairer. My husband also has Down syndrome and I value him with all my heart. And I think society should too. The, the law makes me feel very sad. It is saying that I and people like me may as well have not been born. I was so happy to watch the debate on June the 2nd last year, as 75 members of the Assembly voted to say that this was not acceptable in 2020. Mr Chairman, it is special for me to meet you today because I was so excited when I listened to your very hot comments about me doing the debate. You said of the same final amendment, our amendment, our amendment, welcome to important intervention by disability campaigner Heidi Crowther, who has been referred to today and rejects the specific legislative provision in the abortion legislation that goes beyond fatal fetal abnormalities, to include non fatal disabilities such as Down syndrome. I support the amendment. Thank you. It makes me so happy to be here today as as you look at the bill to make this commitment reality. Thank you for caring about people with Down syndrome. Thank you for listening and stay happy. Thank you. Thank you, Heidi, and your voice has indeed been heard. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Thank you for that contribution. So uh, we're going then to um, Lynn. <coughs> Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman, for letting me speak here today. Um, in Great Britain, 90% of babies found to have Down syndrome are aborted. And this is also a shocking statistic in our inclusive society. In response to that, the Don't Screen Us Out campaign worked across the whole of the UK, seeking the, the reform that would afford the appropriate support to pregnant mothers and to people with Down syndrome. Down syndrome doesn't discriminate and people with the condition are to be found all over the world and in every social group. As such, our campaign represents families and people with Down syndrome from a wide range of backgrounds 
who hold a wide range of views about issues such as abortion. For our campaign, this isn't an abortion issue, it is a discrimination issue. 21 years ago, when my daughter Rachel was born with Down syndrome, society had a very different view around disability. Equality laws were just in their infancy. Even as some people's perceptions are beginning to change, it's still the case that most people don't understand what it is to live with Down syndrome. And in Great Britain, women are often making decisions about their wanted pregnancies without full knowledge of the reality of life with the condition. Survey work commissioned by Public Health Scotland and published in 2019 revealed that whilst Down syndrome was known, most respondents admitted specific knowledge of this was limited. That is why we applaud the Assembly for rejecting the Westminster regulations promoting abortion for non-fatal congenital conditions in June last year, and why we are delighted that Paul Given has subsequently introduced this bill around severe fetal impairment. This bill is important because it will send out a clear message that Northern Ireland promotes equality and consideration for those with Down syndrome. <coughs> Sorry. And a move in this direction will lead the way for other countries to follow. Clearly, screening and abortion for disability has had a profound negative impact on those found to have congenital anomalies. And despite these impacts, people with the screen for conditions are rarely consulted. Me meaningful consultation in these matters has to include people like Heidi Crowther, and I applaud the committee for having her speak here today. Add to her perspective the conclusions of a small study of people with Down syndrome published in 2017 for Nuffield's NIPT report, which highlighted, according to the study's author, a negative societal view of disability, which the people with Down syndrome described in terms of lack of understanding and fear, standing in stark contrast to their own more positive life experiences. Northern Ireland is required to have an abortion law which doesn't perpetuate stereotypes. The way to do that is to, to support Paul Given's bill because singling out a minority group on the basis of potential of disability does perpetuate a stereotype. That much is clear from the picture we've seen develop in Great Britain over the years where a life with disability, disability is conveyed in a medicalised manner. Moreover, obligations under the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities entail that disabled people and their families should be accommodated, included and supported by society. Yet, the evidence suggests that parents of children diagnosed with congenital disability are not given the information and help they need to choose to bear and raise their disabled child. Evidence also suggests that an unconscious bias exists within many areas of life and particularly in antenatal situations where women are offered an abortion as soon as they find out that their baby has Down syndrome. Where women's decisions to continue with these wanted quick pregnancies are questioned time and again. In a survey published in 2019 of 208 women who found out that their baby had Down syndrome, 69% of them were offered a termination in the same conversation. We agree with sentiments expressed in the Assembly earlier this week that we need to stop the perpetuation of stigma around conditions such as Down syndrome. And the move to change a regulation which is clearly discriminatory is a good place to start. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you very much. Um, so listen, I'm going to go straight across to members' questions. I have a number of indications there at the present time. Uh, at this point in time, I have Cara. Pam, Jerry, Paula, and Jonathan. So we'll start there with Kara Hunter. Go ahead, Kara, or yeah, Kara Hunter, please first. Thank you, uh, Chair, and I'd like to thank uh, the panel for being here today. Um, my question refers to the proposer of the bill, to Paul. Um, Paul, thank you for being here and your opening statement. I'm just wondering uh, what level of engagement you've had with the Human Rights Commission. Uh, doctors, clinical groups, the Equality Commission and other women's groups and if you could detail any responses that you've had that would be great. Thank you. Thank you Cara. Well obviously the bill has been introduced um, to the Assembly and I, I hope it comes through on Monday in terms of the second stage and then that would allow the committee to call for evidence to get all of the stakeholders in terms of providing a response to it. 
But, but obviously the most significant um, consultation exercise that was carried out on this area was when the Northern Ireland office carried out a consultation uh, on its regulations uh, on the entirety of the abortion law. Uh, obviously this relates to a very narrow area, but of those thousands of people that responded, um, 79% um, said that they were opposed to what Westminster was doing. Now this bill focuses in in terms of this one area uh, of that aspect of it, which relates and interfaces across discrimination legislation, uh, and that's what it relates to. Um, but obviously, my engagement um, is very much an open door with whoever I wish to engage with. I've already engaged in correspondence with the Human Rights Commission. Uh, members, of course, will, will be familiar with how laws are enacted. It's introduced. That automatically goes to the Human Rights Commission. Uh, and of course, then the committee that scrutinises it will be able to put this out um, and have a call for evidence. And then everybody uh, will be very much able uh, be able to carry out the scrutiny process of it. So m my door is open um, in terms of engaging with anybody on this because I think it is important that we have this uh, debate uh, and then we hopefully can take things forward to address this piece of legislation. So thank you, Cara. Thank you. Um, my next question refers to, um, statistically speaking, do you know how many abortions like this currently happen under the criteria uh, within the UK on average and how many women from Northern Ireland have to travel to get abortions on these grounds? So obviously in terms of there, there are statistics there that are available around the number of abortions that do take place uh, in terms of Great Britain that provide them. Our, our new legal framework in that respect um, I have asked the question to provide a detailed breakdown in terms of what grounds in which uh, termination of pregnancy have taken place. As we know, in our laws, it's up to 12 weeks for, for any reason, so uh, there doesn't need to be, in that respect, um, specific identification as to what the purposes of that termination of a pregnancy has been. Um, but we know that since the laws have came in place into Northern Ireland, we're, we're approximately around 1,100 terminations have now taken place. In terms of the figures um, in respect of Great Britain, um, I do have that information uh, and I would rather just be precise around that. It relates to 2018 statistics that we have from Great Britain. Um, if you just give me one second, I should be able, worries, yeah. should be able to put that at my fingertips. <laughs> just don't have it at my fingertips here at the moment in terms of the precise details. Um, Lynn may be able to assist me on that question. I was just going to say, I've got the stat here for, I know, I meant to actually have this in front of me, I just didn't have time. For Down syndrome, uh, we were talking about, we were talking about roughly 700 uh, abortions a year, 656 in 2019. Um, and I think we also had a stat before that said there was maybe one person travelled from Northern Ireland one of the years. I might be wrong on that. I'd have to, I could check that and, well, we can check that and, and sort of submit that. Thank, thank you, Lynn, and thank you, Paul. Um, just uh, if you get any further information, I'd be really um, keen to see it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, my last question just refers to pathways. Um, Paul, I'm just curious, after receiving a diagnosis uh, of a non-fatal fetal abnormality. If a woman decides to carry to term, uh, can you outline any kind of financial support that's available, any counselling support that's available? And also the other side of the argument, looking at women uh, who do not wish uh, to carry to term, what kind of pathways, what do the days after the diagnosis look like for them if they wish to seek an abortion? Just if you have any information on that, thank you. So Cara, I, I, I think that's a really good question in terms of what financial support uh, is there to, to support people because that has came through and, and Lynn can talk to this in terms of the, the lack of support that many families have felt um, that, that they uh, would want to have got and that they haven't got. But when we look at the CEDAW recommendations around this, um, it talks about ensuring appropriate and ongoing support, social and financial for women that decide to carry on such pregnancies, and yet that wasn't regulated for by Westminster. So they implemented all the other aspects, but they actually didn't put in the law uh, provision of support for people that want to go through. So that, that speaks to the very issue that you know I'm highlighting about an inequality here uh, and the way in which people with disabilities are treated. So you, you raise a very important point in, in terms of that, and that support does need to be made. Need to be made. But the, the research that has been provided around this 
it speaks about, um, and, and I can refer to you, there was a, a 2018 survey carried out in Great Britain, and it, it, it was of 1,410 women who had given birth to babies with Down syndrome, and that had been from 2000, so this is over 21 years. And they said that 69% of those women were offered a termination in the very same sentence when they were told um, about the condition um, that had been identified. That's 70% that were told about having a termination when the news had just been broken to them. And we know that that, you know, that, that will have came as a shock to people. You know, were under no illusions that that would have came to a shock. And then after advising that they wanted to continue with the pregnancy, 46% of those women were asked again if they wished to terminate. And, and that begs the question around the pathways of care and support so that people feel that they have that support because the evidence would indicate based on that survey that it isn't there. And, and if I can just speak and put on the record, Sarah McNeil, she's married to Peter. She lives in a hotel just outside Ballymena. Uh, and she has a, a, a little Down syndrome um, boy, lovely boy with that condition, um, called Tom. And, and she has spoken about why she supports this bill. Um, and she, says, she said that people shouldn't be blinded by the poor, outdated preconceptions of what Down syndrome is. I thought that our outlook seemed bleak when our doctor first shared her suspicions about our brand new baby. But now I know better. And because I do, I'm going to shout about how amazing our boy is. So there is a real challenge there for us as legislators as to the kind of environment in which this uh, news is provided to people and then what kind of support is given. And I think we need to, to be challenging that. And, and this bill speaks to that. So, Lynn, I don't know if you want to pick up on, on that point as well, just to provide some of your own experiences around this. Uh, there was a call from uh, Nuffield Council in 2017 for uh, new guidance. That there's guidance for termination of pregnancy and um, the Royal College of Ops and Gynae were asked to rename those guidelines and to expand them to include reference and guidelines for people to continue with pregnancy and that hasn't come yet. We're still sadly lacking that sort of thing in the rest of the UK. Um, and yeah, we definitely need that. And I think emotional support is definitely the sort of greater thing because as we all understand for some people and as and it was said to me when my child was born this might come as a shock and it is a shock to some people and we have to help them to to understand um what it means thank you lynn thank you for, for your contribution thank you paul just just to touch on my last point there paul just i know i know we're stuck for time but um you know if a woman is diagnosed and she doesn't wish to carry to term um, are you saying, you know, if this bill were to pass, that she'd have to travel to, to receive that kind of health care? Well, like, obviously, this bill in no way is about you know, condemning women, but it's very much intended to send out a clear message as a society that living with a congenital disability is living with a good life. And that's what this legislation speaks to. So we need to provide that support. Um, you know, obviously, this bill speaks to the basis on which a termination of a pregnancy can be permissible in our law um, is purely on that condition of a the non-fatal disability after 12 weeks right up to birth. Um, it doesn't change the abortion law in any other area. Um, th that can be a debate for another day. This bill sticks to the single grounds upon which uh, a termination would be granted, and that would be solely on the basis of a non-fatal disability. Um, and that's what this bill would, would remove as a condition. It would remain uh, intact the other aspects of the abortion law. Uh, and obviously, one of those areas, um, which has been in Northern Ireland um, for many years, has been around the physical and mental welfare of a mother and um, being grounds in which terminations are permissible. And that, that has been the case for many years in Northern Ireland. But does this bill remove the grounds in which an abortion can be granted purely because somebody uh, at that pre-born stage has a disability. Yes, it does, um, and I'm clear on that. Um, and I believe that that's very much in line with international best practice and international law. And you know, the United Nations has has spoken. Uh, people have, have invoked the United Nations in respect of this issue. And the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child makes it clear 
because uh, it says it uh, in the convention and uh, that the needs there needs to be special safeguard and care including appropriate legal protection before as well as after birth so this is very much in line with the united nations convention on the rights of the child so i want the best law that support and protect both the the pre-birth stage of life and i also want to have the best laws in place that support and protect uh, mothers and families that are going through pregnancies thank you paul and just again to thank the panel for their time as well today mm -hmm. uh, for coming forward thank you okay thank you i'm going then to um pam cameron go ahead pam Thank you, Chair, and um, thank you, Paul, Lynn, and Heidi. And I wanted um, to speak to you, Heidi, just briefly first, if that's okay. And I just wanted to say that it's it's lovely to see you today, Heidi, looking so well. And I, I wanted to congratulate you on your marriage. Uh, I'm sure that was a wonderful day for, for you and your husband and indeed for your family. Um, so thank you for being here at <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> Thank you for being here at uh, committee today and um, thank you for all your efforts, Heidi, uh, for your bravery and um, for your bravery in campaigning to end discrimination towards those with, with Down syndrome. Um, could, I, could I ask you, Heidi, um, if you could tell us what supporting this bill means to you personally? Well, I, I support this bill because I, I am the one who has Down syndrome and I think it's just a fantastic bill. And I think that we should have the same equal protection as any other baby because um, my nephew is 10 years old and I'm, I'm 25, but we are still the, we are still humans and we still have the right to life. That's great. Thank and you, Heidi. And I was the one who has Down syndrome. And my nephew doesn't. And my nephew doesn't. <laughs> okay, that's great. Thank you. Thank you so much. I wanted to say, Hattie, to you, I mean, I was looking at your, your Twitter, and, and I love your, your wee quote about seeing my ability and not my disability. And you can certainly see your ability. So that's, that's wonderful. And I wanted to say that I think you are truly inspirational. Um, and I wanted to thank you again. So th thank you very much. Um, I'm just want to move on to the bill to, to Paul at this stage. Um, just a very quick one for you, Paul. Thank you for bringing the bill um, to the Assembly and just to let you know that my office has been inundated with um, calls for, for me personally to support the bill and obviously I will be doing that. Um, so there are many supporters of the bill, even at this early stage already, from, from my point of view and from my constituency in South Antrim. Can I ask you, Paul, what um, wider political support, if any, you've received to date? Yeah, well, th th thank you, Pam. And, and like you, my office has been inundated with correspondence and supporting this as well. Um, and, and obviously, as I indicated in my opening statement, you know, th this, this was um, bringing forward uh, a piece of legislation based upon the motion that the Assembly passed uh, and obviously there was the amendment as well and, and this was the area where there was the greatest consensus amongst Assembly members uh, in terms of opposition to what had been imposed upon us by Westminster. Uh, and, and so I do hope that there is widespread support um, going to be expressed on Monday, particularly to allow the, the Health Committee to actually get into the detailed scrutiny work on this as well. Um, because I think that is important that this bill um, uh, is tested and I'm, I think every piece of legislation should be properly tested and scrutinised and interrogated uh, and I would hope that, that the Assembly will allow it lead, um, certainly to, to that next stage. Um, but the bill is in my name, I accept that because the rules of the Assembly only allow a single MLA to sponsor legislation. Um, I wish it allowed other members to do that. You know, but this bill has been taken forward with a wider political consensus around it. And I know today there has been a, a um, press release from the, the Don't Screen Us Out campaign in terms of this. Uh, and I'm really pleased that it, it has got political support from people like Trevor Lunn, um, who, has, who has indicated that he will be voting in favour of this at the second stage um, because of the discriminatory aspect of this law when it comes to disability. Uh, I'm pleased that Dolores Kelly has uh, given her support to it and, and publicly now put that 
on the record um, in respect of this. And she says, just again for the record, I hope that this bill gets the support it needs and that people with disabilities here in Northern Ireland will be reassured of society's protection um, and support. So that, that's very welcome. Uh, um, Robbie Butler, again, who um, ha has provided public support today for this uh, in terms of it. Um, and again, um, he, he has a quote today in respect of this as to why he's going to be supporting it. Um, and again, he just says that currently abortion law in Northern Ireland does not value the lives of those with disabilities. It's damaging and it's wrong, and that's welcome. And then I've got uh, Councillor Doyle from um, from uh, Into, who has uh, now publicly went on the record that Into are supporting um, what this bill is about um, because of the way it discriminates around non-fatal uh, disability. So you know, that's really welcome. And I've made this point before that on these issues, it crosses political boundaries. It, 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 it should never be viewed in the kind of political identity politics that we have in Northern Ireland, because these issues are issues that we all have shared ambitions and objectives when it comes to tackling discrimination. So I'm really pleased with that you know, public political support that so far has been expressed by a range of MLAs and, and political parties. Um, but what's been most impactive to me from this bill went public hasn't with respect to the political class of which we're all part of. It's been the voices like Heidi. It's been people like Sarah from Ahockel and um, Lady Laura. Uh, I've listened to another lady, Lindsay, and they've all spoken about how they have children um, that have this condition uh, and how they support this bill. And they don't, they, some of them have said they're not viewing this through the debate around are, are you pro-life or pro-choice and they're viewing it through this is discriminatory legislation and what does that message say to their child that's going to be growing up in this society you know that that here's a law that actually pre-birth would have been a grounds for their life to be ended and and they think that that's not something that is appropriate and they have been the voices that have had the most impact and it's raising awareness and I'm really um, kind of humbled, to be honest, you know, that this is providing a platform for people like that to have a voice and to be heard. That's great. Thank yeah, you. Thank you, thank you Chair. Okay. okay, thank you. So going then to uh, Jerry Carroll, then Paula Bradshaw, then Jonathan Buckley. Go ahead, Jerry. <clears throat> Thank you. Thanks, and uh, th thanks, Katie, as, as well for your for your uh, your comments and contribution. Uh, I suppose, Paul, a couple of questions for yourself. Um, I know you didn't have the figures uh, for, for CARA, um, but I, I was wondering if you had any figures around the uh, late termination uh, of pregnancies uh, in the North um, and what gestation period they, they happened uh, and what the reasons were for, for those terminations. Um, and what, what evidence uh, would you have that uh, those decisions were, were solely or primarily based on uh, disability uh, diagnosis, as you said. Uh, also, um, are, are you aware of the number of people from from here, from the north, who went to uh, Britain uh, before the the legislation changed um, in relation to uh, seeking a termination after twenty four weeks, uh, and specifically as well, um, how many people, um, how many cases uh, was that in relation to a, a cleft palate? Uh, diagnosis uh, specifically. So I have a few other questions, but I suppose I'll, I'll just have to respond to those. Thanks. Well, th thank you, Jerry. And there, there's some of those specific questions that I, that I can't you know, provide that detail with, but um, and apologies to Cara earlier, but I, I have got now the figures. I've been able to find it amongst some of my papers. So in, th these are figures that, that we have, the latest ones around 2018. So, and it relates to obviously those that took place in England and Wales. But in England and Wales, there were 3,269 abortions that were undertaken because of what's termed fatal uh, abnormality. And of that, 618 abortions were, were recorded as cases where Down syndrome was the principal reason. And 18 of those were after um, 24 weeks, which you know, we know even in our own law in the 1945 Act speaks of the kind of point of viability that people would speak of. So you know, that, that, that speaks to the specific kind of figures, and that, that goes to 2018 in that respect. Um, I, I have been seeking to get um, precise figures in terms of Northern Ireland and, and of questions that have been outstanding now for, for weeks in terms of getting a response to them. 
but they're some of the, the, the best figures which speak to the kind of general principle um, that this bill is seeking to address um, in terms of the number of abortions specifically around the Down syndrome, but in total it was 3,269 3, around fetal abnormality. And that's the point that I go to, Jerry, around this bill, that the severe fetal impairment um, uh, is undefined in terms of what, what does that cover, but it is deliberately mirror, mirrored on the 1967 Act. And the 1967 Act speaks about being seriously handicapped and the interpretation of seriously handicapped includes uh, Down syndrome, cleft lip, club foot, and, and that's what this law is mirrored upon here in Northern Ireland, and, and that's why I'm, I'm seeking to have it changed. Um, so I appreciate there's some other specifics there that I haven't been able to give an answer to, um, but obviously that's something that you know, we would want to, to get more specifics on. I, 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 if I can just make the wider point, you know, I accept that in terms of the numbers that we're talking about here, it's small, but that to me speaks to why exactly we as a society where we seek to protect minorities, we, we seek to make sure that there isn't discrimination against minorities is all the more reason why we need to act. And it isn't then, you know, this also has an impact upon those like Heidi, um, you know, who are very much alive, and yet they see here a piece of legislation that you know, they regard as being discriminatory. So this also speaks to where we are today as a society for, for both those people who are alive and their families and friends and, and how that impacts on how wider society views people that have this condition. I was going to say, um, I've got a stat here that we had in one of our press releases in 2016 in Northern Ireland. 52 children were born with Down syndrome uh, and one was aborted. So, you know, you're looking at that sort of stat compared to in Britain where it's 90% of women who find out that their baby has Down syndrome who go on to abort. Okay, uh, thanks. And uh, I mean, I, I would take issue, uh, Paul, I mean, maybe that f in relation to this conversation about, you know, standing up for minorities in terms of your party's own record, you know, uh, supporting welfare reform and, and other regressive uh, measures, but we'll maybe get into that. Uh, in another uh, discussion and debate. Uh, I wanted to ask you specifically, uh, Paul, as well, uh, have you spoke to any fetal medical consultants um, at all? Uh, and are you aware of uh, the, the scale of the uh, waiting lists for, for people who are trying to get access to speech and language therapy um, in your own constituency as well as other areas um, across, um, across the north? Well, I, I have a, a meeting lined up with the General Medical Council actually tomorrow um, uh, to, to speak to them in advance of the debate that's happening tomorrow. Uh, and in previous capacities, when this issue was debated at length, um, uh, in terms of the wider debate uh, around laws here in Northern Ireland, uh, I met with you know, the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynaecology, and, and um, we, we have I have had many discussions in terms of this area. Uh, and again, this is where the committee has a very important role to call for that evidence and hear directly from people um, who will be able to give their views on these sorts of things. And I, and I would welcome that engagement. But if I can just, you know, in terms of one of the medical practitioners who, who I've spoken to and has went on the record on this, Dr. Sarah Har uh, Harris, who, who is, a, is a general practitioner, um, but also you know, works um, in other spheres within our medical. And she says that as a medical professional, I'm involved in supporting individuals throughout their lives journey from birth to death. I know firsthand how they provide joy and happiness to everyone around them. And I've seen how many of them lead full, vibrant and fulfilling lives with numerous opportunities available to them. And in that context, she goes on to say about this current law, its existence implies that those living with disabilities are in some way inferior and not entitled to the same chance in life as those of us who merely have the privilege of living with good health. Being born with a disability does not make you any less likely to lead a fulfilling life than anyone else. To make this assumption is contrary to everything that I stand for as a medical professional. So, you know, obviously there will be, uh, I think there may well be differing views in the medical profession on this, um, you know, but that is one uh, medical professional who is very much in favour of what this bill is seeking uh, to do. Okay, thank you. Okay, going then to Paula Bradshaw. Go ahead, Paula. 
Um, thank you, Paul, and thank you to panel for being here today. I think this is a really important conversation that we're having this morning. Um, I just want to, since you're here to talk about the general principles of the bill, Paul, I just um, just want to uh, put on record that I have been really engaging with a wide, wide range of opinions on this, and that included on Monday night I attended a, a, an online pro-life event and it was interesting to, to hear you say that your door is open because they had indicated that they had tried to secure a meeting with you and you have refused it to date. They feel disenfranchised that you have worked with UK Care UK that are based in London and did not work with local pro-life groups on, on this bill. They're disappointed that your party's pledge that the first item on the agenda when the Assembly would be res was restored would be the repeal of the whole abortion regulations. Um, so what do you say to them? They are disappointed that this bill does not um, outlaw abortion in its entirety. So that's my first question. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Paula. Uh, and I'm sure CBR will be delighted that you're advocating on their behalf. Um, in, in terms of that wider debate, again, I'm going to stick very much to what the principles of this bill is about. I appreciate that some members may want to to stray into a, a much bigger debate around abortion law uh, and you know, whether you're pro-life, pro-choice uh, and that terminology. But this bill is about disability discrimination in respect of that. Uh, and uh, to, to that point, I have met with uh, any organisation that has sought to meet with me on this, including that one. So you know, that's obviously uh, inaccurate in terms of uh, from a factual position. But obviously, the general principles of this bill relates to uh, disability discrimination legislation, and that's what this is about. Okay, thank you, Paul. Um, you focus very much, on, and, and thank you to Heidi and Lynn, uh, and um, yeah, thank you, thank you, Heidi. It's great, great to have you here today. I've spoken about my aunt who had Down syndrome and how much we loved her as an individual. So I think you're absolutely right to um, challenge societal attitudes towards people with Down syndrome. So thank you for your contribution this morning. Um, I read last night then the um, paperwork on Don't Screen Us Out. Um, so I'm going to focus in on that, if you don't mind. Um, the, the screening process at the minute, will, when, when they look at Down syndrome, but they're also looking for Edwards and Patoy. Um, are you suggesting through this bill that we would seek to remove that screening process as part of the antenatal services? Um, and uh, would, would another way um, be to look at this as the Republic of Ireland, where you would list those severe fetal impairments um, that could not be terminated on the basis of, of um, a, a diagnosis? As you know, Paul, there were, there's probably about 40 severe um, fetal impairments and would it, and like a whole wide range that our fetal medicine consultants know a lot more about. You know, it takes them about 18 to 20 years to get to the point where they understand this medicine. Would it not have been better to look at it from the you know, almost isolate Down syndrome and some of the severe fetal impairments and say that they could not be grounds for abortion as opposed to the whole 40 plus that, that um, our medical professionals are looking for in those scans and screening? Thank you. Well, I, I suppose, Paula, that, that speaks to the, the weakness of the legislation that Westminster imposed upon us because um, they didn't define the, you know, what would be severe fetal impairment in, in the regulations, and, and that's one of the, the, the problems. Um, um, and therefore, it is that interpretation and mirroring of how um, that legislation based upon Great Britain and the 67 Act has been implemented. Um, in terms of am I seeking to remove... Obviously, you, you have the, the kind of non-invasive non you know, prenatal testing that takes place. I'm fully aware of, of all of that. Um, uh, no, in, in terms of if that's going to be a pathway to provide the kind of support that needs to be available for people, um, uh, that, that would be my answer to that. But I suppose it's that terminology, and, and Lynn can speak to this, about screening. And scre you know, that's, this is why, obviously, they don't screen us out. Um, is is the name of the organisation because you know we see in other countries this language about you know um, screening out and you know we have eradicated um, you know this diagnosis as though somehow that's been a cure and I think that kind of pejorative language um, we we need to be very careful with in terms of you know what the screening exercise is all about and um, so Lynn maybe you want to pick up on on that aspect of, of screening and, and how that impacts yeah. Um, yeah, we are not against screening per se, but 
it's we have to make sure that screening is done in a way that, that, that sort of reflects how we think in the 21st century. So we will be screening for a, a much wider range of things going forward. And that's that's also why this is important. So while you're looking at small numbers today, as you say, Paula, there's lots of other conditions which we are going to widen uh, and bring into screening. So I think in, in terms of our campaign, it has been a good time with the introduction of NIPT, um, apart from to stop the kind of discrimination against Down syndrome, to, to make sure that we're sort of saying, well, why are we screening? How are we doing this? Are we doing it the best way we can? Or are we creating more sort of stigma around congenital conditions? If that, does that explain? No, 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 absolutely. No, I appreciate that. And, and I suppose this all cuts to the heart of the fact that we got the regulations last year. None of us were in the assembly at that point, you know, and I have said on myself and Paul were on TV probably about three years ago that I wanted this debate i wanted anything around abortion legislation or regulations to take place through up this sort of process and not through westminster but we are where we are with that so i fully agree and i'm wondering again this is more of a wider statement than a question whether this is a role maybe for rqia which would be our sort of local regulatory body to actually look at the full range of issues that you have raised here today around the language that's used by our healthcare professionals when a diagnosis is made, the type of screening, the timing of screening, the support services, whether I know that some trusts have a psychologist and, or a social worker on, on board if, if they, this diagnosis is there, others don't. So there, there's a lot of work that we need to do in terms of support for the families because, again, I'll put it on record, people say I'm pro-abortion. I'm not. I'm pro-choice, but I want to make sure that women are absolutely supported around this issue. So the, the, the third question, um, Paul, is in relation to um, the potential that if this um, bill um, passes into law, that women um, will seek a, an abortion before 24 weeks under the grounds of mental um, or physical impairment. And when I met with um, the fetal medicine consultants on Friday evening, they were saying that there's the potential, when you get a diagnosis at 20 weeks, whether it's whatever condition it is, whatever impairment it is, it takes a couple of weeks then for for, for further t tests or scans or other um, investigatory work to take place that may take women over the 24 weeks, which then means that there's a potential that women will use that grounds in law to have an abortion at 23 weeks plus six days, rather than give themselves the opportunity to find out the full facts so they can make a full informed decision as to whether they would carry the fetus to term. So can you speak to the potential unintended consequences um, from this sort of um, amendment? Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you, Paula. I, I think that that argument um, can be equally applied to every other form of, of pregnancy. Um, because obviously you know, we're all familiar now with the law, it's up to 12 weeks for any reason. The issue that I have, and I believe others have, is that after 12 weeks, there are three grounds on which uh, a termination and can, then, that can then be permissible under the law, and that's obviously around the mother's physical, mental health. Then it is on the what's termed the fatal fetal abnormality, the life-limiting conditions, and then based upon severe fetal impairment. So all of the other types of pregnancies up to 12 weeks you are, no, are, are then, in terms of, of the pre-born stage, they are protected in law after 12 weeks. But here we have a category which is singled out as not being protected. So I think the argument that you speak to around, is that going to then lead to people, uh, mothers in particular, making the case around their physical and mental health as a reason why um, you know, they can't proceed with the pregnancy? That can be equally applied to every other form of pregnancy that is no longer permissible under the law after 12 weeks. So I don't think that's unique um, in terms of the context of, of you know, this law that discriminates on the grounds of disability. Thank you. Sorry, Chair, I've got one very small question. Very small. Very brief, um, follow, please. You'll be aware that the Iona test can be um, um, purchased for £320 in our private health care providers at 10 weeks, and that can identify the three um, Patoy, Edwards and, and Down syndrome. So there's the potential, based on what you've just said there, that if a woman got that scan at 10 weeks, then she could terminate the pregnancy. So what you're doing almost is creating um, uh, a situation where women who have means and money 
could get a termination and those that don't have the money um, couldn't. So what, what's your response to sort of the socioeconomic consequences of this? Thank you. Well, again, like I don't believe this should be viewed through the kind of economic advantages or disadvantages when it comes to classes around our society, and, and I wouldn't want to view the protection of people with disabilities on that on that basis. Um, you know, so I, I don't accept that narrative around this. Um, that that you know, if you have the means to pay, I suppose we need to look at what has happened, and, and Lynn can speak to this better than I can. You know, where you have the non-invasive prenatal testing that's taking place um, in, in Great Britain, what has been the consequences of that? It's led to an increase of termination um, for people who have Down syndrome. And that, in terms, how does that help um, when we have a duty to promote and defend people with disabilities, when actually that process has led to greater disadvantage for that minority grouping within our society? But Lynn will be able to give better examples on that than me. Yeah. Uh, just to be clear, the Iona test or, or any of the other tests are still screening tests, so they will provide a screening result. And for, say, younger a younger woman, they're not very reliable at all. And for women in an old, older age group, they are quite reliable. But they are just another screening test. So although people can maybe get results at that time, I don't see that that would be... Um, a major sort of issue because, as I say, you still have to go in and, and have all the different tests. Um, yeah, that's what there was a report uh, in the Sunday Times um, around some hospitals in England, uh, NHS hospitals that are using NIPT to say that births have been reduced by 30% in those hospitals compared to hospitals that aren't using NIPT. And I think that's the issue we have to keep coming back to is that we're not, we can introduce new tests and whatever, and we just don't seem to be hitting the issues here, which is women are still seem to be scared of, of this, you know, the outcome. And, and it's such a speculative thing about how your life is going to be. And what we know, as Heidi has said, is that people that have children with Down syndrome are happy. Research is telling us that. And that's where it's all very different from. It's about abortion. It's about women being reassured that actually their life's not going to be bad. Their life is still going to be good. No, thank you. I fully understand that. I was just really trying to get the technicalities of the bill. Thank you. Thank you. Going there to Jonathan Buckley. Go ahead, Jonathan. Thank you, Chair. And can I thank Paul uh, for briefing us on the general principles of the bill? Uh, and I do look forward to further scrutiny at different stages uh, following the debate. Uh, on Monday, I will be supporting the bill, and I support the intentions of it. I, I believe that the current law is both discriminatory and wrong, and I do so also on behalf of the thousands of constituents in Upper Ban who have been in touch with me who equally believe that it is discriminatory and, and wrong. But I want to talk, and I'm excited to talk and see Heidi with us today. So, Heidi, thank you very much for your briefing to the committee. Uh, you're very, very welcome. You have been an inspirational young lady. Uh, or disability rights. Uh, I, there's, I've known many people who know, now know you as a household name in Northern Ireland for everything that you've done. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you. You have given a voice to those who have otherwise felt voiceless for far too long in, in this process. So we really do thank you for that. But I want to hear about your life. I want you to tell us what led you to be involved in a campaign such as this. And also, um, you know, how day to day you find the discriminatory um, legislation in relation to your life? Well, I've told about your life. Oh, well, um, I, um, I'm, Heidi, I'm Heidi Carter and I got married in July 2020. To an amazing guy called James Carter, he's gorgeous. He also has that for them. Um, I look in the bits and. Um, in 20, do you remember Heidi in 2016? That was your first when you were outside Parliament. I oh, yeah, uh, So basically, um, how I got involved in this, me and my mum met an amazing lady called Lynn Roy. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and then um, so I spoke outside Parliament and I. Uh, 
So I think that's why I have notes. And the reason why I got involved in this is because in 2018, they were, the government were going to bring in an IPT. But they were going, they were going to bring it through um, at, without without consultation. So we, um, we just was like, it's a fantastic campaign led by an amazing lady. Okay. Well, thank you. Can I ask you, how does it make you feel when you hear people talk about crisis pregnancies and devastating diagnosis because a baby has Down syndrome? How does that make you feel as an individual? It makes me feel that I've seen it be here. It makes me feel that I took it back to my mum's womb. Okay. Well, look, we, we really do appreciate you coming to the committee today, and we look forward to further engagement with you as this process continues. Can, Lynn, can I ask you a final question? Because I know we are tight for time. What impact has the law had in, in Great Britain in influencing how the medical profession respond to pregnancies? That... Sorry. Sorry, Lynn. Is it, is it me? Or? Yeah, go ahead, Lynn. Please. Sorry, I, I, I'm, I've lost. Um, yeah, I think that it's exactly what we said. Everything's become very medicalized, and people are trying to convey a life based on a list of medical issues, and you simply can't do that. And I think that's as a society, we've come to realize that disability shouldn't be assessed, a life with disability shouldn't be assessed on, on a list of medical issues. You don't meet someone and they immediately tell you all about their medical issues because you will begin to judge their life. It's something that you might start to talk about, you know, when you meet them, I wouldn't meet you and say, well, I've got a heart condition and, you know, and but that's very much how this is introduced. It's introduced as a medical um, list of, of things and people then, that's what's in the head. It's like, well, how am I going to deal with that? And that's very much only a little part of life and not the fuller part of life. And we actually don't know. It's so speculative. You know, this list is so speculative. Nobody's going to have everything on this list. And there's also some things that people with Down syndrome, for instance, uh, are less likely to get cancer tumours than the rest of society. But again, we don't present uh, this sort of positive mood. Um, so it, it, it's all become very negatively focused. Um, and not, and it's because we haven't been consulting with people with Down syndrome, we don't understand that this is not how a life is. And finally, ha have women and fathers felt supported to continue with pregnancy? Has that been an experience? No, no. We can we can say that I think people that were told, you know, that were given the news, you know, at best, there's just under 50% of them were told in a negative manner. Uh, and some people were told in a neutral manner and one or two in a positive manner. But uh, almost half the people told were told in a negative manner. And you know, my daughter was born 21 years ago and actually my experience, I now know, was actually was actually fine. But the stories that I hear right up until this year are that people, even when they've made a decision, I had a couple come to me earlier in the year, even when they've made the decision, the next scan they went to, they were taken into a room and they were told, Oh, that there's a region here in the brain and it's okay now but if it's not okay the next time you can then you know think about your decision and they were saying to me we've already made our decision why are they questioning us so you know we just can't see they can't seem to get away from that because there's always this thing where you can board up to birth so you know we'll, we'll have to keep checking in with you on the way that you're sure about what you want this sort of gaslighting uh, that women are, 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 are sort of exposed to Okay, well, thank you, and can I thank Lynn and thank Heidi and Paul, and I look forward to further engagement as we go through this bill. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you. Yeah, and, and can I just say, I remind members that we're here to discuss the principles of the bill, and I don't want those who have come along to be put on the spot with, with personal type questions in that regard. Um, we respect the fact that they're here to assist in terms of this principles of the bill. Um, so I'm going to Alan Chambers, please, Alan. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, Chairman, uh, I'd just like to thank Heidi and Lynn and Paul for their presentation this morning. It's been very useful. Uh, over the last three weeks, uh, Chairman, I've received a huge post bag uh, of, of emails and letters 
uh, around this particular bill. And um, if any of the people who have contacted me are, are, are actually listening this morning, can I apologise to any of those who haven't yet received a response from me, but I am working my way through that and everyone will receive an acknowledgement from me. I, I find this a very emotive and a, a very sensitive uh, subject, uh, Mr Chairman, but I certainly I welcome the forthcoming debate around this very focused piece of legislation that is designed to protect against uh, disability discrimination and I will be uh, supporting it as it makes its way through the Assembly process. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you, Alan. Okay, listen, I want to thank all of our panel for coming along today. Um, I want to thank uh, the, the mover of the bill, Mr. Paul Given, MLA, uh, Lynn Murray, and also I want to thank you, uh, Heidi, for coming along today and for assisting the committee uh, in, its, in its consideration of the principles of the bill at this stage. Thank you very much and good luck to you all and please take care and stay safe in the time ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good day. Stay happy. Bye, Bye, Heidi. Bye. Okay, members. So, um, I can you can members hear me? Can you hear me there? Okay, Clark. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, Chair. So, members, a point. Yeah. Go ahead, Carol. Um, so it's just to be clear, we're discussing the general principles of the bill. So. Um, you know, I know some members have declared their positions, which is up to them, but we still haven't heard from the Human Rights Commission and indeed others. So it's just to make that clear. This is just about general principles of the bill. Yeah. Okay. And and in in relation to that, the second stage of the bill is scheduled for debate on Monday. And as chair, I will outline the committee's position on the principles of the bill and consider the consideration that we have had of the bill today. So there are two options then, essentially, that the committee at this stage takes a position on the principles of the, of the bill, um, or the alternative position is that we take no position at this point in time on the principles of the bill. So that's really what we need to consider now. Well, chair, I, 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 I don't think we can... The committee can't take a position, even though personal members have outlined their position. Um, I'm asking that the committee don't until we hear from the Human Rights Commission, um, because that would actually undermine the arguments we made in preparation for discussion on the general principles of the bill in the first place. Yeah. Sure. I, I, um, yeah. yeah, you. Yeah, Jonathan and then Jerry have Jonathan yeah, no, and then. Um, Individual members will have views on, on this bill. That'll be expressed, no doubt, on, on Monday. Um, but I do agree with Carol's point that I don't think the committee is in a position to get or to, to give its position at this stage. I, I think that's been done before where the, where the committee wouldn't form an opinion until uh, committee stage. So I'm happy to support Carol's proposal, if that, if that was a proposal, that we don't form a committee opinion uh, at this stage. Okay, so I'm going to Jerry, and then I do see Paula's indication. I'll come to you next, Paula. Go ahead, Jerry. Yeah, sure. I, I agree. I think at this stage we, we can't make a, a decision because there's a lot of information that's just incomplete. We haven't received, and the proposer um, didn't have a lot of that today. Um, so I, I would like. I mean, I, I'm opposed to the bill just to put that on the record and, and to be upfront. And I would like to see the committee at a later stage when it has all the evidence in front of it uh, taking a position to um, oppose the bill uh, as it currently stands. Uh, but I think for now we have an incomplete um, uh, set of information and we can't take a position. Thanks. Thank you, Paula. Um, thank you, Chair. Absolutely. I don't think we, we're in a position to take um, a committee view on this, but I just wanted to um, address an issue that Jonathan just raised there. I, I talked about a devastating diagnosis on the radio. Um, I wasn't talking about Down syndrome. I was talking about the broad range of severe fetal impairment. And I have heard from a lot of parents who do see it as a devastating diagnosis for a much loved um, baby, a much wanted. So it was in, in the broad terms. And I thought that was a very low, low of Jonathan to try and pin that against Down syndrome. I have spoken very personally and publicly about family members who have Down syndrome, and I think it was outrageous of you to do that, Jonathan. Sure, I would like to respond. Uh, firstly, firstly, I did not mention any member's name. 
And secondly, uh, I, as a member, am entitled to ask how people with Down syndrome, such as Heidi, for her opinion when language like that is used. So I did not name any member, and I will not. Okay, members. Um, so I think I think there is broad uh, agreement that we don't take a position at this stage of the bill. Are members content with that? Content. Yeah, members content. Okay, thank you, members. So moving on then, um, we have a uh, SR 2020-2021-39 to consider today. It's the Health Protection Coronavirus International Travel Amendment Number no. Seven Regulations. Uh, NI 2021. So, members, agenda item eight is uh, is this is this uh, SOR. I can advise that Elaine Colgan is here today to brief the committee on the provisions of the SOR. Members will recall that a number of issues were raised at last week's meeting in relation to it, particularly around the provision in relation to offences under the Fraud Act, and the committee agreed to write to the department to seek further information on this. A response has now been received from the department and is in included at tab 8.5 of the table pack. The response provides further information in relation to the Fraud Act. So can I now welcome Miss Elaine Colgan, who is Chief of Staff to the Chief Medical Officer. Elaine, are you able to hear us there? Yes, thank you, Chair. Are you able to hear me okay? Yeah, hearing you there, Elaine. Thank you. So if you want to go ahead and outline your, your briefing in relation to this SR, please. Okay, um, so good, morning, or good afternoon, Chair and members, and thank you for the opportunity to brief on this amendment, uh, which is the 2021-39, uh, uh, so it was amendment number seven for, for this year for the travel regulations. In February, we undertook a Northern Ireland-specific review of the sectoral exemptions, which followed the, the English review, uh, and Scotland and Wales did the same. This amendment uh, implemented the changes brought about by that specific Northern Ireland review, and they also made some changes to exemptions that were agreed UK-wide by ministers. So I'll summarise these changes. Firstly, in order to remove the blanket exemptions from travel restrictions for all applicable sectors, the regulations introduced categories of exemptions. So there were three categories of exemption. The first one was that those who availed of them uh, would have a requirement to self-isolate when not undertaking the activity which provided the exemption. Uh, category two or category B was for those people that would that would be required to self isolate um, for non UK based individuals, and category C was a requirement where the self isolation should not apply at all. The second change for this amendment was permission for aircraft and vessels from countries listed in Schedule Six, which is known as the red countries. Um, so permission for those vessels and aircraft to come to Northern Ireland if they are operated by or in support of a foreign country, where UK government has first provided written confirmation that they are travelling to undertake official business in the UK. The third change in the amendment was the removal of exemptions for road passenger transport workers, tunnel system workers, Eurotom inspectors, people receiving healthcare or live donors, UK workers who regularly work abroad or workers who live abroad but regularly work in the UK and finally seasonal agricultural workers. Prior to the decision to remove these exemptions, a consultation was carried out um, between ourselves and the other relevant government departments who were impacted to make sure that uh, the removal of these wouldn't have a, an adverse impact here. The next change was the requirement for information regarding pre-departure test result notification to include whether the test was a PCR test, and if not, the name of the device that was used for the test. The regulations also made changes to some of the countries included in Schedule 6, which is the red countries, and it added Azores, Madeira, South Africa, the UAE into those countries, and included the Azores um, and Madeira in the list of countries and territories from which vessels were prohibited from arriving into Northern Ireland, and these addressed alignment with uh, England provisions that we hadn't addressed previously. And finally, as you mentioned, there was an inclusion of a reference to the Fraud Act in the provision for self-incrimination to allow information and evidence provided on the passenger locator form to be used in any subsequent prosecution for any offence under this UK-wide Act. And as you mentioned, a written response did, um, did uh, issue the committee, um, and I'm happy just to run through the main points of that, um, if helpful. Uh, so the the provision allows the pass information on the passenger locator form to be used as a prosecution under the Fraud Act. 
providing false or misleading information then can attract offences under the Fraud Act and departmental officials gave consideration to the offending behaviour, including travellers to Northern Ireland, providing dishonest information on their PLF. And the main reason um, that this, this was raised was in the context of managed isolation being introduced in England and they made the change at the same time as that was introduced and so that the information could that, that uh, fraud was, was it was seen as perpetrating fraud if you lied on your pa your passenger locator form or provided false information in order to avoid managed isolation because you got a financial gain by failing to have to pay for the managed isolation um with when, when northern ireland doesn't have direct international flights and doesn't have managed isolation in place uh, because we don't really need it until we have international flights then there was the potential for, for someone to um, provide false information on their passenger locator form to avoid managed isolation in England um, and so we felt that it was um, merited to introduce that here at this point uh, and that it was proportional to the health risk of the increase or the potential importation of a variant of concern into Northern Ireland. Colleagues in Department of Justice and PSNI were consulted on the inclusion and raised new issues. And just to note finally that whilst 10 years imprisonment is the maximum sentence available um, under a conviction or indictment, most, if not all, convictions that may result from this will carry a much lower sentence. Um, so I'm happy to take any questions this committee might have. Thank you, Elian. So firstly, from me, um, what feedback did the PSNA and the Department of Justice give you in relation to including reference to the Fraud Act in this SR? Uh, they, they confirmed that, that from their perspective they had no issues with it. Okay, and then can you outline a scenario uh, where someone would be likely to face charges of fraud following this regulation? It, it's not so much that we're actively pursuing this necessarily, it's just adding in the option um, that if, if a, that, that it is now considered to be um, the, that the information in your form could be used uh, to uh, provide evidence if, if a case was being taken against the Fraud Act. We haven't said that this is an active enforcement measure. What we have said that is, is if a prosecuting authority wants to take a prosecution against you under the Fraud Act, then the information on your passenger locator form could be used for that. What have you considered? What what sort of scenario, or have you kind of uh, have you kind of forward forward that for even for unforeseen consequences, where that may be used in a way that you're saying it's in there as a kind of a safeguard, not intended to be used. So you must you must have an idea of what you would consider appropriate use of it. Um. So the the fraud act itself has um the the. the um, so, I'm trying to best describe this. So, the Fraud Act, the, those that prosecute under the Fraud Act um, aren't affected. We haven't sort of actively approached them and asked them to to, to actively chase people um, for this offence. So, we are engaging with PSNI to see if, if they would regularly take um, prosecutions under the Fraud Act, but we haven't asked them to for this. Um, so, we will have to see how they what they come back with. We haven't identified any unintended calls. Consequences um, as as yet. Uh, if if anyone has any information on unintended consequences, we're more than happy to consider that. Okay, I'm going to go to members there. I'm going first to Pam and then I see I see Jonathan. So Pam, go ahead, please. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Elaine. You're fast becoming a permanent member of this committee. With all your attendance. <laughs> It does feel that way. <laughs> I look forward to the day when we don't see so much of each other. Yes. Um, <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> but yes, um, Elaine, it's indicated that um, part of the SR exemptions for those receiving health care have been removed. Can you tell us a bit more about this and what this relates to and who could be affected? That's my only question. Um, yes. So. The exemption for healthcare was removed um, really because we didn't anticipate that there would be demand or any high demand for people to travel internationally to Northern Ireland to receive healthcare. Um, we don't have a large private market here. Um, we did consider that, that kind of context. That was the first thing we considered. The second thing we considered was the environments into which they would be coming. So healthcare environments um, 
pose a greater risk because of, of the infections that's, that's there generally in healthcare. And so we wouldn't have wanted people not to be in self-isolation if they had been in that sort of environment. So we, we for both reasons, we removed it. Okay, thank you. Okay, is that it, Pam? Yep. Okay, going to Jonathan. Go, Jonathan Buckley, please. Sure, you have answered or asked many questions, so I'm fine. Thank you. No. Okay. So uh, another another one then, just Elaine, for me in terms of um, has anyone been charged with the fraud element to date, and what plans has the department to monitor and review that position ongoing? Um, not that I'm aware of. There, to, to in order to be. Um, taken under the fraud act for this, you would there would need to be a, a prosecution, so that would still that would go through the normal prosecutory method in Northern Ireland, which would be forwarding to public prosecution service for consideration. Um, so it wouldn't it would be a, a lengthy enough procedure, uh, and we we will keep monitoring that. But as far as I'm aware, there hasn't hasn't been anything action taken on that. And how how would you monitor? How would you, how would the information flow to you, or what channels have you set up to ensure you're aware at all times of the impact this is having on the ground? Well, we have a weekly meeting uh, with all of the kind of governmental stakeholders on the travel generally, and PS and I are part of that as our border force local border force um, colleagues. Um, so we, as I mentioned earlier, we are, we are engaging with PS and I to see if the fraud act is something that they prosecute. Um, we also have. Have an operational group with UK government colleagues who are involved in enforcement in England, so we can, uh, through that group, um, seek a way to monitor whether there's any cases being taken in England for forwarding to the Northern Ireland Public Prosecution Service, if that makes sense. So we can investigate if that's happening and that we wouldn't get it from PSNI. So using those two mechanisms, we should be informed of any cases that would be going forward. Okay, thank you. I have Orlea and then Jerry. So go ahead, Orlea. Um, thanks, Chair. And um, yeah, Elaine. So uh, I suppose it's similar to, to Pam's point that she made. A lot of this seems really repetitive at times. Whenever we're, um, you know, in our land, questioning with yourself around some of these ASRs, but and it might sound like it's stately obvious, and you've you've heard it all before. But um, is there a reason why you know when when the department um, and and your team were consulting with the PSNA and the Department of Justice? Um, around some of the aspects of this statutory rule, is there a reason why the committee couldn't have been consulted at an earlier stage, as opposed to um, you know just receiving this information today? Um, time is really the only reason, Orlea, and um, and it, it's just the pace at which these things are happening and it, it is a real challenge and it's something that we are struggling with as well. Uh, ideally, and I think it was mentioned the previous time I came to committee, we would be submitting SL1s to committee before we make the regulations, giving you an opportunity to consider the policy change that's being brought forward. Um, um, we still do keep in the back of our head that at some point we would really like to get back to that process where we have time to issue an SL1. Um, but at the moment, it's the turnaround is so rapid, um, and and it's just such a challenge at, at pace uh, that the earliest we are able to do anything really is the SL5, at which the point at which the regulations are made. Um, but please do be reassured that we would prefer to get back to the point where we are informing committee of these things earlier, and if there is an opportunity to do so, we will do that. Yeah, no, that that's fair enough, Elaine, and um, I appreciate that, and hopefully, um, because I know maybe a lot of this is you are having to react um you know really quickly to these things but hopefully you know i mean because we're now a year into it um that that space and time will start to open up where you can be bringing them forward as sl ones as opposed to the the statutory rules and the committee can have a bit more of an input but thank you yeah no thank problem. you and and jerry please jerry Carroll. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Elaine. Uh, Elaine, it's not specific to, to this SR, but I know you've obviously came before us uh, with pretty much all of them or the vast majority of them. So it's something that I, I think uh, for yourself and your team and, and the department, I suppose, mainly to put on the radar. Um, the detail um, website have revealed that um, the in terms of uh, community uh, response notices uh, served by the PSNI, 5.4% were given to people from BAME backgrounds. That's 5.4%. 
Uh, this is despite the, the group making up around 1.8% of the total uh, population. So I think that's very, very concerning. Uh, for me, points towards, um, you know, unfair targeting uh, of communities. Um, and presumably that's mostly around the Black Lives Matter protest. But to me, that suggests that there needs to be extra work done, um, if not by yourself, then by the department to ensure that these regulations um are fair, aren't discriminatory, and are targeting people who uh, um, don't need to be targeted, uh, if you will. So I, I appreciate you may not have that information, but I just wanted to share that for yourself and for other members of the committee as well. Um, thanks, Jerry. Uh, the community response notices are issued under the general restrictions rather than travel. So the travel ones, the only, the only thing that is issued by police is a fixed penalty notice or not. Um, however, it is a valid point that you've raised, uh, and I'm happy to take that away uh, and work just to liaise with PSNI on that and see if there's any action that they're looking into on that for the general restrictions. Thanks. Appreciate that. Okay, thank you. And, and just a very quick one for me then as well. It's kind of uh, occurs to me on, on the back of some of what we've discussed, Liam, but how do you ensure, say, the like of, say, someone, a wide range of people coming in, Say something as basic as literacy problems or being able to read the form and fill the form out correctly. What monitoring is the department taking to ensure that no one's discriminated against in terms of equality in that respect? Um, yeah, so the, the first thing is around literacy problems, um, there is a helpline on the, the, at the start of the form on the UK government page that you can phone if you have difficulty for any reason in completing the form and there's people at the other end of that phone who can who can provide you with this assistance and um, on the language the non-english speaking language uh, issue the ni direct um i can get you details of this and more details of this in writing um, and it's also that ni direct have been doing some work on the, the general translation of the site uh, and we've also been working quite heavily in the last couple of weeks of trying to make the information then i direct uh, easily more easily understood on travel it is a very complex area and it's, it is very difficult to convey the information succinctly in a way that enables people to quickly get the answer to their particular travel query. Um, but we've done the best that we think we can on that and updated the information. Um, but I can provide you some information on what NI Direct has now done on that as well, generally. Yeah, and, and I think you need to redouble your efforts in that respect, given that this is a, a fairly significant increase in terms of the punitive outcome that this could have. I think then it's the responsibility on you to to make sure that that's working and people are being supported. So listen, thanks, Elaine. Thank you for that. Uh, I think that's all we have for members. Thanks for your appearance today once again at that committee. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye. Okay, members. Okay, members. Before before I go on to our formal consideration, um. I can advise that the committee's this is the committee's last opportunity and it's subject to the SR subject to negative resolution. The examiner has since reported that the SR is in breach of the 21 day rule, but she's content with the reason for that and has no other issues to raise. I do think this is an issue that, that we would want to keep a bit more of an eye on, even if we do agree to formally allow the rule through. I think it's something that we should be including a request to the department that they would keep us updated. And maybe we revisit this one again in a number of weeks, say 10 or 12 weeks, just to see if this is having an unforeseen impacts or unequal impacts. So with, with that, if our members agreed with that before I put the, that we add that, and then I put the formal. Yeah. Okay. So can I... Uh, if there's no other comments from members, I'll go to the formal consideration. No. Okay, the Committee for Health, can we agree for, I ask the members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2021 forward slash 39, the Health Protection Coronavirus International Travel Amendment Number 7 Regulations 2021 and has no objection to the rule. Are we agreed? Great, Chair. Thank you. So members, I, I then propose to take a very short break just to allow broadcasting, which will have to come to an end. And we return there at, at uh, 13.35, please, just to go through the correspondence on the forward work programme. And if I could ask members to return, I will try to get that done as, as quickly as we can today. So we're taking like a two minute break. Thank you. Sorry, Chair, just to mention, if a member leaves at this stage or exits out, it'll be difficult to get back into the meeting just because okay. we're not being broadcast and it's not being managed. Um, so if you have to leave your 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 desk, just sort of leave your. Well, do you know what? Maybe maybe we should just uh, maybe we should just go ahead. If we can if we can end broadcasting, take a pause to end broadcasting, but stay in the meeting, and we we'll go immediately to correspondence. Maybe we'll get that addressed. Okay.
signed by Janet Chamber. Program signed.